I had to do something wrong. <laughs> Hello, bird nerds and plant nerds and fungi nerds and camera nerds and those with gear acquisition syndrome. It's Friday. I'm Grant. I am a bird nerd. Um, and with me today, one of the members of the Riot Squad. So this is like a first, and I'm really excited to have Glenn Smith with us. G'day, Glenn. G'day, mate. How you doing? Good, mate. I'm impressed with that um, uh, amazing background. You've got one of those uh, million-dollar uh, backdrops. You're in a, uh, a corridor that Cockatoo goes on forever. Island. That's a tunnel on Cockatoo Island. I took that a couple of years ago. Oh, there you go. I was thinking it might have been an old... Um, uh, uh, an old background for like Doctor Who or something. It's got that. No, 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 no. Oh. It's one of, one, of the, one of the tunnels under the dockyard island. I used to actually work there. In the 80s, I did my apprenticeship there. So, Okay. Well, that, well, there's a good spot to start. Before we get right into um, images and yeah. cameras and techniques and stuff, and boy, jingos, have we got uh, some images to get through today. Um. Tell us about your apprenticeship, Glenn. My apprenticeship was in drafting. I was a draftsman at Cockatoo Dockyard drawing submarines for the Navy. Oh, wow. So, um, when we used to have the old Oberon diesel electric submarines. If you had, just had have hung on another 30 odd years, you could have got some of that 38 billion, mate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you've, you've missed out there. Yeah, um, but they shut shut the dockyard down. When I went back there, it was all taken over by um, gulls, silver gulls, and they're all like almost a rookery full of silver gulls nesting and young running around the place. It was really different. Oh, that's all. That's almost hell on earth, isn't it? <laughs> Being surrounded <laughs> by thousands of silver gulls in a uh, in an urban area. Um, yeah, but they were all nesting. It was a different. It was a different environment. They're all taken over. Everything. They had little nests all over the place. Well, they're such a highly adaptable species, so we shouldn't really be uh, surprised. And it's not. I mean, Cockatoo Island is not a place that uh, is widely visited by, you know, hundreds of people at a time. It's no, it's only, you only get to it by a ferry. Yeah, and it's only access, like, you can't drive it. And would there be more than a hundred people working there at a at a time? Nowadays, no. No, but back then in the in, in the oh, back the then no, there was, there was, back then I think when I joined, the, they put on an apprentice intake of one hundred and twenty something people oh, apprentices. Okay. So, so there was quite so a lot it, of people. The dock so had a big couple deal. thousand people. Yeah, big deal. Big no, it, was deal. A, it was a big going concern back then. Now, if you're watching on Instagram, because I know we are going live on Instagram, and I have to be um, uh, very mindful of being inclusive, um, you can leave comments and I'll be popping over to, to have a look. Everyone else, uh, let us know where you're watching from. And hey, since we're talking photography, why not put your gear system in? Like, what, uh, what are you using and... You know, when we get a bit into the discussion a bit later on, perhaps tell us what you would love to be using. Uh, Glenn, your regular listeners will know that you're you're often part of the show in the comments and yep. and giving us some ideas of, of what you're seeing and some of your experiences. And you're working yep. at um, Mount Annan Botanic Gardens, which is. Um, out of Sydney, how did you get from Cockatoo yeah. Island, training as a drafts person, uh, to working at one of the best botanic gardens in the country? Well, we'll go go back a step. I volunteer there. I don't actually work there. That's, oh, well, that's so almost the volunteer. same. Yeah, that's almost that's the it. same. That is. That I've even got the uniform. I've got my swipe card that'll let me in everywhere and. Open the gates up and all the rest. So, yeah. yeah That's right. So, it's, so apart from drawing a wage, you work there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. We don't do that part of it. We don't get the yeah. fun part. But, yeah. no, what we did, so I was at Cockatoo Dockyard for about five years until I shut it down. 
So uh, Cockatoo cool. Dockyard got shut down from the dockyard with the government sold off. They are going to turn it into Japanese hotels at the time. That didn't happen because the ground was full of toxic waste and things. That's so right. I remember that. It was, that was all right for us to yeah. work on it, but um, yeah. wasn't good enough for hotels, so that's different. Yeah. So that all went into mothballs for years. Now they've turned into like a tourist attraction, come historic tours, come glamping and a few things. So that's what happened to the dockyard. Um, I went from there and I went working for a pump company, global pump company in the mining industry, which is not the great place for somebody of my sort of idea, but I worked there for 23 years. So that I lived out Campbelltown. I used to work yeah. at Artarman, so I drove... Two hours each, well, I called a train originally, two hours each way in a train. So it was four hours a day. Yep. And then I was driving, took worked out the same, two hours each way as I progressed up the chain there. Um, and that's where I got on a thing called podcasts. Ah. For four hours a day, I listened to photography podcasts. Ah, well. Um, that's where I... a lot of my skills came from, from photography podcasts, listening to podcasts saying, do this, try that. So I'd go out and try them on the weekend. So w were you doing audio only ones or were, were you listening to yeah. like, I I'm not sure, do, um, uh, Tony and Chelsea Northrop, do they, is their YouTube show a podcast? Do um, know I don't know. I occasionally watch them on YouTube. I don't watch them that often. But yeah, no, there's a whole stack of podcasts. Some are bird orientated wise some are nature and wildlife orientated and some are just general photography podcasts and gear and the latest news there's all different ones and some are more entertainment than photography but you got four hours a day to kill in traffic so yeah yeah that's podcast kind of, became very useful yeah that's right and of course there are some amazingly good podcasts out there uh, some that yeah. uh, some that cover birds and photography so exactly you know, um, yeah. which which should be widely shared. Um, yeah. When when did the um, when did the love of photography and the attraction to cameras begin, Glenn? Probably from about age of ten. My father got both me and my brother. We had a camera each, old film so what, camera back then. What before there get? was auto anything. So there's not even a light meter in the camera. You had to have a light meter external to the camera. Yep. So, so back what, then it was. Yeah. What, what was it? Was it like a one of those simple box cameras, or what? Like, um, I mean, this yours would have been before those Agfa. Remember those Agfa ones that all everyone used to get for Christmas or birthdays that were like, um, yeah. They they were a sort of a take off. Oh. Uh, that was very Doctor Who. You've you've time travelled <laughs> from, from Cockatoo Island <laughs> into your living room. <laughs> are you going to show it to us? Yeah. You? You've still got your first camera. Well done. Ah, oh, okay. I had a Practica camera. very much like that. So, so what's that? Is that a? Yeah. I can't see the brand. That's not showing up. Okay. Yeah, I can't. I I think it's a Russian one or something like that. Okay, so it was like the um, yeah, not, there were Minolta's. Brand. Yeah, there were Minolta's yes. that were very similar that was, to that. I remember. So yeah, uh, yes, yes, okay. yeah, there were Minolta's. I I progressed from this to a Minolta X seven hundred, and that was okay. my go to camera for years. Okay, came up. It actually came up and came up had Minolta, and Minolta decided came up wasn't the right brand for Minolta for their known brand so they offloaded them and they're doing them half price so i bought a thousand dollar camera for 500 bucks oh, wow. i had the and top of the range minolta it would have been a beauty uh, back then uh yeah okay uh naomi i see your comment we'll be getting to uh to 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 comment soon so uh a, a, a russian uh yeah then into the I think, Minolta. I think that's where it was. Russian or East German? I'm not sure. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I think East German might might be the one. Yeah. I think. Might be. Um, uh, and then and then getting into Minolta. Yeah. Have you? Uh, I mean, have have you had that sort of loyalty to a type of camera, 
Um, like, did the Minolta lead you into anything in particular? No. No, it no. did not. No. So what, what Minol- happened? Minol- Sorry, yeah. how, long, how long were you with the Minolta and that's sort of the entry level where you're learning the uh, 35 mil, uh, I'm guessing it was a 35 mil lens on... Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so learning, you know, the the happy snaps, the portraits, the street photography that we all go out and do when we start. Well, it was more what I did back when I was at the dockyard. So I, you know, I was an apprentice. You didn't earn a great deal of money as an apprentice, but you earned money. And what you do on your holidays, you get yourself on a bus trip. Oh. They used to have these camping camping coach yeah. trips yeah. out back Australia. Yeah. So the first one I did was a 16 day trip. Camera, two lenses. Yeah. So I had uh, what I thought was a big telephoto lens, a 200, uh, went from 70 to 200, and a wide angle lens. So I had two lenses and a body. I thought, whack, oh, off we go. And I came back with what, about 16 rolls of film or something like that. <laughs> so I off and then got them all printed up and all these sexy shots, and you know, which nowadays, if I look at them, I'd sort of laugh at them and go, really? I thought they were good. But anyway, oh, they, and- they were not bad. And in that those a, days, I'm, I'm wondering if we tracked a similar path. Then, did you uh, did you teach yourself how to develop uh, slide slides because it was much cheaper rather than you know if you wanted to go off and snap uh, ten rolls of uh, of film on a trip, you yeah. you then had to sell your car to get your prints developed. So. Yeah, but that was a couple of weeks of an apprentice wage, and we got them developed. Um, yeah. We used to do black and white developing. We used to do black yeah. and white in mother's laundry. So mum's laundry used to get converted at night over to a dark room. Yeah. So we used to do that for black and white. We didn't really get into colour. Colour was a little bit more fancy, a bit more finicky. So yeah. colour we just got developed. So I'd either use ag for slide film and you send it away and a couple of weeks later you got a box of slides come back. Yeah. Or I, most times I just got little six by four prints and that was whatever. And they just went into a giant album. And that's the way I do it. Like that, I used to save up the money to get the um, Ilford eight by ten box of Ilford eight by ten, and uh, and and get into the school uh, uh, school dark room, which was basically a cupboard. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, yeah. I'd never during school. I never really played with photography. I was too busy getting into me sciences and all engineering and all that. So I did. Engineering, science, chemistry, physics, and all that sort of stuff, and it was just full on that sort of tech stuff. So, so photography sort of was pushed sort of aside for a while in school. With with the tech background, um, yep. well, well, technical background, uh, yep. and and the the drafting, yes. were you drawn to that phase? I think we go through early on of photographing uh, buildings, brickwork, uh, architectural features. You know, did, did you go through that? The, the, no, uh, no. Oh, you I didn't. didn't go through that. The, no, uh, no, I've, I've always been pretty much nature and environment and wildlife. I've never okay. really got into, as I tell people, I shoot the three Fs. So I shoot fungi, flora and fauna. And I don't <laughs> shoot anything that talks back to me. Oh, well... Um... Yeah, I, I was very much doing people and yeah. um, yeah. I might have been influenced a bit by my sister who was really into photography. Like um, she was taking photography at school and wanted to go off to college and everything. And I was I was only uh, a year level above and yeah. I thought some of her stuff was really cool. So I tried to do the 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 wispy, whimsical beach shots in the in oh, black yeah, and yeah, white yeah, and all yeah, that, yeah. but I was shit at it. I was better at people, so. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done a couple of those sort of things, but, you know, every now and again they have organised photo walks and I'll go on some of those in different places and that, and, you know, you'll do a few of those sort of things, but in the end I go, it's not for me. The gardens yeah. have got me doing a lot of their events these days, so I do photography events for the gardens and that's what I do. People, I've, they've, you know, contact me and said, can you photograph scientists, whatever, they've got promotional work coming up, can you photograph this scientist? I'll do that sort of thing. But that's sort of the limit of the people I do. I'm a whole lot. Usually avoid anything that talks back to me. I've, I've mentioned this many times before, I think, and 
especially how some aspects of photography are very similar to bird watching. So I'm assuming you don't like to go out taking snaps in a group. Usually not. No. I, I have done. The other week I did. I went out the other week. Um, we went out. There's a local reserve out our way. We've got koalas, about 16 wild koalas or so out there. So we shot koalas. We had glossy black cockatoos, um, powerful owl. And there was a group of about 40 people in that group. So it was a big group, which I usually I avoid groups like the plague. But, yeah, I usually find when I'm with a group I don't get good shots, funnily enough. Yeah, funnily enough, well, uh, if you're in a group that big, you don't usually get good birds, do you? So No, um... but this, we, you know, we, the birds were, yeah, the group was well behaved. The group was all about caring yeah. and bit with the environment. So the group, group was all, you know, they weren't rat bags running around like nuts. So we had good, a good group. The group leader was good. You know, he cared about the environment. He cares. He's out there looking for things. So that, so that was good. And, yeah, that was We've got two koalas for the day, powerful owl, which is a regular down there, and um, yeah, cut a pair of glossy blacks. So that wasn't bad for outing in a group. Well, you can never complain about getting a glossy black and a powerful owl is a uh, is a bonus at any time. And hey, for New South Wales, um, uh, koalas are going to become uh, a, a a rarity on any trip. So. Um, mm. Yes, no, at Campbelltown Way, we've got one of the few um, disease-free colonies of them out here. So it's, and they've got... But, but Pe- Penny Sharp's workout. doing her best to uh, to get rid of them, though, isn't she? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah we've got a- Appen development. There's a big development at Appen with Appen Road being widened. And they've knocked down all the trees. They've put a big estate in there. All the trees went. That's part of it. So you've got Appen yeah. down to the Darwell National Park. And Smith's I'm, Creek. I'm not sure, but I think that's a broken promise, isn't it? That that was probably that they were definitely saving that. Well, yeah. let's uh, let's just pop Naomi, Naomi's comment up um, about Naomi's system before we yep. go exploring Glenn's gear a little bit more. And this yep. is a hook for everyone else. All of all of you on uh, YouTube and Facebook and uh, uh, oh, YouTube and Facebook. There we are. Um, let us know what you're using or what you would like to use. Now, Naomi's a Nikon uh, Nikon person, and yeah. um, iPhone eight. And iPhone is um, excellent for those quick, close. Uh, yeah. I I I think of it as i i naturalist or um. Uh, or that kind of photography with the iPhone, just snap that. What's this flower? What's this weed? What's yep. that? Not much good for yep. birds unless you're feeding pigeons or something, I guess. Yeah, what you can do, but you can put them through binoculars too. So you can put your iPhone up the binoculars. And I've seen a few people that do really good shots shooting through binoculars with an iPhone. And there are pretty cool adapters too for yeah. um, for. Uh, scopes and binoculars yeah. and um, yeah, so iPhones, yeah. uh, iPhones are pretty good. I must admit, yeah. I've got an iPhone seven, and uh, I find it very hard to find any of those extra lenses or whatever that are still available. I think they're yeah. all uh, a, a yeah. bit more uh, up now. Yeah, yeah um, and that two hundred to five hundred lens. That's not that's a nice lens to play with for birds. That's, you're starting to get the right sort of length. Yeah. Yeah, you need um, you need to be up around the 500, 600. I use an eight hundred, so you need to be out that distance. And, and of course, um, that's in the in the full frame world, uh, whereas people like myself uh, with the in the micro uh, four thirds world, yeah, uh, when uh, when <laughs> when I finally save up for my. Uh, 100 to 400, that's the equivalent of a 200 to 800 lens, which is... That's true, uh, it is. Yeah. Which, no, my brother, is, my brother shoots the Olympus Micro Four Thirds and he's got that, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it. yeah it's, a good, uh, it's a good lens. Very pricey when you're getting up to big lenses, but we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Let's yep. pop up, let's pop up a uh, 
a a visual. Um, now we're going to do a lot of birds, but Glenn we did are. mention the three Fs. Um, yep. So let's let's start with with one of the Fs. Yep. Tell us, tell us what it is. Do, have you accurately uh, identified this particular no. body? No. No, I didn't bother identifying fungi in the end because the chief scientist in the garden, and he's now actually um, acting CEO of the garden because the CEO is just transferred to a new department. So the chief scientist out in the gardens, his PhD is in fungi. And I okay. asked him one day, I said, what's the best book I can get to identify fungi and how do I go about it? And he says, well, he's got a, I know he's got a PhD in fungi. He says, he can get a fungi, he can do a spore print where they put the cut the fungi and drop yep. it on a bit of paper and it drops the yep. spores. Yep. And from that, you can get a print and you get the colour and you get the shape. He says, I can do a spore print. I can look at it. I can do a microscopic analysis of it. I can cut it up and dissect it. And by the time I do all that, I can narrow it down to three to five type. And I thought, ah, so you yeah. can't identify them. I said, oh, if you can't identify them, I'm just going to take pretty pictures then. Yeah, I, I think with, with, with fungi, if you can uh, if you can isolate the group that that yeah. it belongs in, I reckon that's that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so at the moment, I don't really bother with doing that. So the reason fungi, and this is going back to really how I really got into photography seriously, um, used to be a thing called Google+. Plus. Google Plus used to be a social media site. Yeah, by Google I, years ago. it was it, it was awful too, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> but what they used to have is weekly themes. Oh yes, I and did they, too. And they had a theme called Shoot Shrooms Saturday. <laughs> Shoot Shrooms Saturday had nothing had nothing to do with a pipe or a bong. <laughs> Absolutely not. So every Saturday, I would go out and take a picture of a mushroom. That was about 10 years ago, and I still do that today. Oh, So today, well, every a... Saturday, you'll find me in the gardens. So I'm in the gardens all day, every Saturday, and I'm looking for a mushroom to shoot. And what I'm trying to do is get a better shot than I got previously. All right. Well, that, well there's a good segue into the technique uh, that you applied to this shot. Yep. Um, yep. Now, is it? did you take this with your standard lens – and what's the light, the approach to lighting in this shot? Okay. So this is where over the years, I, like I say, I shoot a mushroom every Saturday and I'm trying to get better. And the podcasts that I listen to were always banging on about use off-camera lighting, use flash off the camera. So I started off with one flash with a infrared trigger from the camera. Yep. Then, then I got... That wasn't working at times because sometimes I was putting the light behind it and if they don't have line of sight, it doesn't work. So then I got radio flashes. And eventually I got up to the stage I'm using three lights. So this has got three lights used for this shot. Now, coming back to my background of being very technical and scientific-wise, I'm a very technical photographer. So I get into the nitty-gritty and technic technicalities of it all. So I've all used right, three well, lights. Well, hit, hit, us with, hit us with every detail here. Yeah. yeah. The blue light is achieved by using a brown light on the left-hand side of the shot. So you've got blue on the right-hand side. Yep. Right. So I've used a brown gel, which is like a brown piece of plastic over the front of the flash on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side. Okay, so your so your blue light, which is on the right hand side, it's not blue light; it's a white light. Uh, okay, it's a white so light. But, okay, but it appears blue because you're using a brown filter on the yep. on the flash, which is on the right hand side. And then what I've done, I've used white balance to correct for that brown light. Okay, so, so in so color it's, science, color science, the opposite yep. color to brown is blue. Yep. So when your white balance correct to brown, everything else turns blue. So if I've just lit up the mushroom with a brown light, yep. Otherwise, I'd have to have masses of blue light to light up the whole background. 
So yeah. I light the mushroom with a brown light. White balance correct it back to normal daylight. The background then goes blue. Very so you nice. got that surreal sort of feel on the side that's not affected by the brown lights. Yeah. So that's what gives that effect. So I've got. Now, a... you, sorry, yeah. you, you said there were three lights that you used on this yeah. shot. So we've got the 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 white. Brown light. Yeah. Well, we got the white flash with the filter that turns it yeah. brown on the right. Yeah. We've got. Um, blue or just a, a white light which corrects to blue on the right correct and does that mean you've just got a white light at in the front and there's usually one to just sort of either fill in the front or the back yep. in this okay. case it's a bit on the front now okay. the other thing with lighting if you go back and you imagine a full moon you see a full moon you don't see any craters you just see this horrible white disc that's right which is why I never understand why people like taking pictures of the full moon because it's just you might as well take a picture of it in a plate, really. But if you get the half moon, quarter moons, you can start seeing all the craters. Yep. Well, or so, even even one or two days uh, yeah. before or after. Yep. Exactly. Because you're getting that side light lighting the rims on the crater. So what I do with these, I've got the lights to either side of the mushroom which then brings out all the shadows and texture on the stalk and those gills. And, and the gills, yeah. and you know, All that texture, that because if I had the light, if I had a pop-up light on the flash, on the camera, you're just going to get directional front light and it's going to flatten the light and you're just going to get no texture. So the lighting is always from the sides. And about 80 degrees, 80 degrees off camera axis, so a little bit from the front just so you don't get yep. full shadow. Yep. I adjust the power so I've got different lighting on right side to the left side and sometimes i'll have the light coming from the back and just give a bit of rim light as well and what you're and doing with the lighting sorry oh I, I was really interested in how uh are they all triggered simultaneously yes. with with a flash yes and yeah, the radio trigger. there's a radio trigger mounted on the camera and that radio and trigger fires all three flashes together and and they all have the same duration They've all got the same duration, what they've got different intensity of brightness. In diff different intensity and different temperatures, yep. yep. Um, and are they angled, at, at, off to the left and to the right, are they angled downwards? Like, um, Look, They're actually it, lying it, on the ground. The flashes okay, are so, lying on the ground. Okay, so, and that's how you get the, uh, the effect off to the blackness towards the top, yep. yeah? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, because what I do, and you'll see that in some of the flower shots later on as well. Yeah, they're all yeah, well, they're all taken in daylight and most often in full sunlight as well. So, okay. if I so the... expose the shot, basically, do I get a black frame, and then I'll bring in the light and I'll sculpt the light, position the lights how I like to get the actual image shape the way I like it. So that's a really good tip, isn't it? Because I think, well. People in, in uh, and and thank you. I've seen the the comments. We'll get into the uh, people's systems again in a minute. So hold on, everyone. Uh, but l give us an idea in the in the chat. Would you have looked at this shot and assumed that it was taken in full sun outside in the middle of the day, or? Or did the illusion get you to think that perhaps it's in the middle of a deep, dark uh, forest? <laughs> or uh, out on a spotlighting trip? Uh, so we'll just see if people come up with those. Uh, Glenn, I'll just put up a couple of comments before yep, we sure. uh, get on to another one. Um, Vicky says hello to us both. Hello, Vicky. ATD Cannon. Yep. 150 to 600. 1. 6 times. Yep. Yep. Uh, oh, and been uh, very good. Been on uh, some of your photography workshops. She has. Um, yes. Yeah. Very, very, very good. Uh, and Zoe. Hello, Zoe. Welcome back. Um, 90D. Uh, okay. Yep. 90D. Tamron yep. 18 to 400. Gee, some of the, some of the new Tamron lenses are amazingly yeah. good value yeah. um uh, zoe let us know do, do you know whether it's like a a, a a fairly recent 
lens or or one that's getting back more to the uh, vintage uh, yeah. vintage time. Um, not as he- it's not as heavy and as big as some of the five hundreds. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The 90D, the 80Ds, my first digital camera was a oh, was a 350D, then I went to the 60D. It was when I got to the six, Canon 60Ds when I started getting a bit serious with my photography, and that's when I attended workshops in the gardens, and that's when I took off with my photography. And all my earlier mushroom shots were with the 60D, 100mm macro and a couple of lights. So, I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask you about um, cameras and bodies and yep. and and whatnot in a in a little while we'll race yep, through we'll race through some shots but yep. uh uh zoe said she's managed some nice shots of birds and sunrises and sunsets and uh and she's yep. loving this photo uh you're gonna love what's coming up zoe i can tell you i can tell you that um and look, look folks we've taken a little bit of a different approach today than I have with some of the other photography Fridays. Um, some of Glenn, Glenn's shots will appear, in my view, and I hope he's not insulted by this, but less arty, but um, are really indicative of some of the technical points that I'm hoping will be drawn out when we're uh, when we're talking about it. Um, Naomi yeah. says she was absolutely tricked uh, by this. Now, Glenn, do you intend to trick people when you set up a shot like this, or are you approaching it more from um, uh, from what you can bring out of the subject, like the detail that you can pull out of a, a mushroom? Yeah. What a lot of it is, is... And it's the same with bird photography for that matter as well. A lot of it is what you're trying to do is isolate the subject. So if you've got a flower, you've got a bird, or you've got a mushroom for that matter, what you want to do is remove all the distracting background. So no matter what you're shooting, what's your subject and how do you make your subject stand out so that's what you're bringing the person's eye to. So with a mushroom, the best way to do that, I find, is lighting because if I can kill off all the horrible backgrounds behind it, because sometimes there's paths, there's, you know, this is a botanic gardens. You've got signs, you've got people, you've got all sorts of things in the background. So if I can kill the background to black and just use light, the subject stands out. The foreground I've played with a bit of post processing to turn the foreground a bit surreal in this case. That was going to be my next question about yeah. the, uh, the, well, I, pre- I presume it's um, uh, bark and, and sticks. Yep. Uh, it is. Yeah, and well, I'm, I'm glad you owned up to that without me having to, uh, no, to no. ask you because it certainly looks like the front and the uh, right uh, or the, the right-hand yep. quarter, um, you've done something with blurring or some kind of uh, yep. post-processing in that. Yeah, and, and you'll see that in some of the other images as we come through as well. But the, yeah, and, the main and, and look at I... look at that look at that Naomi's asked, did you do any post production? So okay. Uh, and another thing is, once you start talking playing macro work like all this fungi work is, though it's not true macro, but it's close it's close up work. You run into a problem called depth of field. So your big problem once you get any anywhere close to a subject is you can't get the whole subject in focus. Your depth and... of field's only about two millimeters. Even if I go up to like F32 on a 100mm lens, about 30 300mm oh, away from the subject, your depth of field's maybe 2mm, 3mm. So to do that, you've got to use a process called focus stacking. So you take a series of images and then you've got to use post-processing to then merge them all together as well. So they've all been focus stacked and they've all then had a bit of a play with general playing usually in Lightroom, and then I'll bring them into a program called Topaz and create the artistic okay, effect. Okay, so... Uh, um, and, and are you using various uh, various bits of the Topaz? Because I think there's four modules that you can get, I think, with, with uh, Topaz. all sorts of things. This this yeah. one was in an older version. Yeah. Sorry, um, so... There was a so- software called Topaz Impressions. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which they they it's now um what are they call they call it legacy software now, so they're not yeah. actively selling it. They're now selling the topaz sharpening, topaz. Yeah, Digital yeah, where you have to buy the different yeah. modules depending on what you want to do, yeah. which was... Yeah, well, they got uh, one now that's called, I think it's Photo OII that can, combines all... Yeah, together. yeah. does upscaling, denoise, and sharpening all in the one. Now, I, I wanted to have this discussion at way down the end, but since we're, okay. Since okay. we're there now, let's, uh, let's, let's put this image up again. Yep. Now, can you tell us... Just quickly, the camera, the um, and the and the lens you shot with this, yep. and then I've got a, then I've got a question. Yeah, so that one that was a couple of years ago. So that was probably the sixty D. The lens would have been the Canon EF one hundred mm macro, and that would have been either two or three lights. Looking at that, I think it might actually only be two lights because I'm not seeing any rim lighting on it. So. I think that was two lights before I got the third light. So there's two lights, Canon 60D and the 100mm macro. And when you're doing the settings on this, like are you are you using manual focus? Are you yes. choosing the ISO? Yes, um, 100% okay, so, manual. Okay, so... so Every, everything I do, and this just, yeah, and there's there's no right or wrong way, but... I shoot 100% manual. With birds, I use autofocus, but mushrooms, I use manual focus. All the lighting is all manually controlled, so I'm manual, in full manual mode with the lighting where I set the intensity of the power with each light. Um, so I've got lights manually controlled, focus, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture is all manually controlled. So I have full control of what I'm creating. I'm and, a control freak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just so people get an idea of what goes into setting up this shot. How, yep. how long did it take you to, um, uh, well, apart from choosing the subject, because that's the whole different part of the argument, but once you've decided yep. to uh, capture this fun Usually on store, something like this, I might do three different setups. So I'll take a shot, I'll put the lights where I think, and I'll take a series of shots focus stack it so i'll take maybe 20 shots with the different focuses going through it um then i'll move the lights around and try in a different place so i might move, move the lights more to the front more to the back change the strength from left to right try different angles or even move the camera maybe 10 degrees around the subject just try a different angle so i might do about three different setups but i can basically walk up to a mushroom these days and i can take a shot in probably about 10 minutes i'll have the whole series of shots done and dusted but um, it can take me half an hour as well. Yeah. Post-processing so, wise, I can do that probably in about maybe 10, 15 minutes. So the whole thing will be done in 10, 15 minutes post-processing. So I'm not spending hours and hours on the subject. Uh, have you got to the stage with your post post-production uh, system that you have a template for, for fungi and a template for flowers and a template for birds or... Uh, no. Do you pretty much know what your settings are and you, you just dial them straight in? I Exposure-wise, I don't have to do a great deal. Sometimes I've got to bring out some of the shadows details. Sometimes I've got to drop some of the highlights or darken some of the background. These days you can actually mask in the subject. So you can have the subject masked or the background mask and I can just hit, uh, darken down the background. Because when you look at an image, you usually get the eye gets drawn to the brightest part of the image. Or the sharpest part of the image. So if you've got something bright in the background, your eye is going to be drawn straight to that. So whatever's sharpest and whatever's brightest is where your eye goes. So you start playing with trying to draw where you want the person's viewing eye to go. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, let's let's have a look at a bird, or and I, I'm dri dipping down the list a bit because. Okay. Because uh, of some of the things you just said. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at this. Um, yeah. So you talked about the brightest spot is where your eye gets drawn. Yes. Uh, and uh, so that was very leaves. that was very fortuitous that that you uh, that you said that. And uh, with that in mind, everyone in the audience just you may have heard about. 
the rule of thirds when people are talking about composition. But yep. Blends just talked about that principle that the brightest part of the photo is where your eye gets drawn. Now, I want to know from you, Glenn, with this one. Yep. The it's roughly working on the rule of thirds. I would say it's that's not quite right. Yep. But the but the spa, the fortuitous uh, placement of the male satin bowerbird directly yep. below the the brighter spot yep. sort of lines up with the bright spot on the left hand side of the bower. Yeah. And then fortuitously there's a female bowerbird there. But I there I is. wonder did you get drawn to that to that sort of grid that is roughly on the rule of thirds uh you know the bower the the edge of the bower one third to the left the bright spot one third to the right or, yeah well this, this or shot, was this just a fluke <laughs> it, it's 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 very much that way this shot is really tricky and there's a few issues to raise in this shot too because you've got to worry about ethical birding here as well so yes the way this shot is taken the camera is probably maybe about 60 centimetres, two foot away from the bower. So and are you really lying close. on the ground for this shot? No. The camera okay. is. I'm not. Okay. So, so what you... I've done with this, yep. I've set up the camera when the birds weren't there. Okay. I've set up the camera to take a shot every 40 seconds. And I've walked away leaving the camera on the ground. Okay. So and the I've framing... about an hour and a half. Okay. So, again, I... I I'm guessing you were never thinking about the rule of thirds, but I think how it becomes second nature. Where you've yes. placed the camera, where oh, the right. bower is, yeah. is sort of subconsciously you pop it in that part of the frame, don't you? Yeah. You, 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 I've actually got my camera set up, so it's actually got grid lines on the screen. Yeah. So you can actually yeah. see the rule of thirds on the screen. So yeah. you're halfway setting it up to start with that. Um, when I set up the camera, the sun wasn't out. The sun came out over that time, so the sun comes out and lit up the leaves. You really try to expose for the subject. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to have a couple. I've already had a couple of goes. I've had, I think, three goes at this shot so far. This is the best I've got so far. I'm still not happy with it. The shot's not that. It's good for the action and good what you're seeing, but I'm not happy with the quality of the shot. I'm not happy with the lighting. There's quite a few things I'm not happy with. But it's still one of those shots that you don't normally see, so it's... Well, that's why it's included. But it's included for the ethical standard of I'm not sitting there annoying the bird. I've got the camera on the ground. The camera's basically on the walkway. There's a path. This is in the garden beds where you've got paths. So the camera's yep. basically sitting on a path where people walk past constantly. So the birds are used to people there. So the camera's on the ground, basically in the walkway. I actually did it the week before and somebody saw the camera and they went to pick up the camera. They go, oh, somebody's left their camera behind them. <laughs> I'm sitting on a rock not far away, so I can see the camera. So I'm seeing yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, uh, uh, you know, I go, oh, is that your camera? I said, yeah. I go, oh, we thought somebody left it behind. I said, yeah. No. Uh, that, that's where you want one of those um, uh, Bluetooth speakers where you can sit it next to the camera. And if someone's coming towards you, you can, in your microphone, walk away now. Walk <laughs> away now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I really like this shot because of, a couple of things you you mentioned. One is that it's a really interesting opportunity to get um, a bower, an active bower, yep. with yep. the uh, with the decorations, and it shows quite clearly the preference for blue with the satin bower yep. birds. But with the, yellow as well, they they use blue and yellow, so they actually do it like Ukraine colours. Okay. Uh, I can see some sort of greeny yellow leaves and a bit of green. That's green yeah. and yellow electrical wire, is it? There. Yeah, uh, it's a whippersnipper. Well. Whippersnipper. Oh, leaves. whippersnipper cord. Okay. Yeah, cool. they've, they've discovered whippersnipper cord and blue bottle caps. Oh, very good, very good. But the but you've got to be you've got to be careful with that too because there was one there and he was there for a couple of days before they caught him, but he got one of those blue bottle tops 
And they got those blue plastic rings underneath them. Oh, yeah. And what caught yeah. around his neck or around his foot? It was caught around his, it was in his bill. It was in his oh, bill and around yeah. the back of his head. So they had to actually yeah. catch him and get it off. So if you ever get those things, make sure you break them or cut them. Yeah. Just put them in the bin. But or like, make you know. sure you put them in the bin for sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing about this shot, which I really like, Glenn, and why it's so unusual. Um, I mean, you were critical of some of the technical aspects of it. Yeah. But I was racking my brains to think of any other shot that I have seen of satin bowerbirds with the male and the female at the bower where you can you can you can actually see the performance ground yeah exactly I, I don't think I've ever I don't think I've seen one and if anyone else uh, ca- has I've seen video but I haven't seen like still a, a, a still shot like this yeah. published anywhere with the female in the bower the male yep. displaying the the display ground and and the complete bower and and getting an idea of how the bowers are situated often shots of bowers are taken from people standing up exactly. and and they give you a really different view of of what the bower is and what it's sort of ceremonial function is it's it this places it in the bird's perspective rather than from the person's perspective a pedestrian's yeah. perspective which is what i really like about it yeah no, that, that, that that's a good point because that goes a long way with a lot of photography if you look at photography you know these days you're in the world of instagram where people are scrolling through if somebody stops and sees a photo for a lot you know a second you're doing well but the way you do that is you want somebody's attention, take something that they're not used to seeing. So people like waterfalls, and usually the waterfalls have got that slow, blurry water yeah. because that's not what your eye sees. Yeah. The mushroom shots, everyone goes nuts on the mushroom shots because, once again, they're taken ground level, not that standing height level. So, once again, it's not what people see. So in this case, once again, it's not the view you normally see. You Nobody lays on the ground to see birds. So as a result... Once you've changed your angle, you've got a view that people don't see, so all of a sudden it attracts people's interest and the brain says there's something different here. What's going on? So going back to composition and things, if you can change your composition or your angle to something that's not standing height, which is where everybody looks at things, all of a sudden that's you've got a shot that's something's different. Same when they do paper daisies, when they have the big paper daisy display in the gardens. Yeah. I usually get the camera underneath and shoot up from on the ground shooting up through the flowers and get the blue sky and clouds with the daisies from underneath. And all of a sudden it's a totally different view of what you see. And all of a sudden people go, oh, wow. It's a different, just different perspective. Yeah. I'm just looking. I just, I just realized that one of the shots that I really wanted to um, uh, show people, I don't think I've uploaded yet. So I might have to, um, we might have to have a uh, an intermission in a little while. Um, yeah. yeah, but we'll we'll get into that. There's we've got plenty of shots. We've got plenty of shots. Oh yeah, we don't have to um, cover them all, but there's plenty there. Oh, the, there think. was another one that that was really one that we don't u- is not usually seen. Uh, but we'll 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 come back to that. We might we might have a short intermission. Uh, but yep. this one, Glenn. Yes. This isn't taken at the Botanic Gardens, is it? That's correct. That's taken in Tasmania. I do do I do do walkabouts. Okay. That was in Tasmania. Now that shot is this is that shot is you'd normally throw it away. It's a rubbish shot. The shot's crap. Except, what, except that it works. Yes. What I've done, I've used that artifact, turned it into a sort of old master style painting, turn it into like a painting effect. Yeah. And as a result, the slightly out of focus shot, you don't notice it now because the whole thing's become like an artwork as opposed to a photo. Yeah. And and you know, I I was a bit tongue in cheek when I was talking about the the arty nature of the shots. Yeah. Um but this is where sometimes a what what you might perceive as a mistake works yeah. to 
uh, to your benefit. And you've got just the right amount of blur. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some people go, oh, I should have had the shutter set faster. Exactly. Well, no. Fantastic. Yeah, and, so that, and that's why I don't throw it, you know, I've got a hard drive of over 400,000 images now. Only oh, one? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a big hard drive. It's, oh. <laughs> it's a 36 terabyte hard drive. Uh, so now... But that's... yeah, so that's why I don't throw out my images because during the night I play with images and then I'll dig out old images that, you know, normally be crap and you just play with them and see what you can do with them and sometimes you come up with them. That, that works. That looks right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... Uh... Yeah, so, but that's, you know, it's a mistake. It's a shot that's, you know, if you looked at it on its own, even if the shot, shot was sharp, it's a bit of an average shot. It's not that exciting. But by doing this to it, you've sort of saved the shot and you've got something that's presentable. It's, you know, gives it an art feel and you don't have to have everything 100% sharp. That's right, and there's probably commercial publishers who would uh, pay an arm and a leg for that um, if Let you had an alter ego want. as a commercial artist um yeah. you know someone would go oh wow amazing uh now martin's got a comment here which um is uh, yes. completely valid ansel, 100%. Ad ansel adams um do, do you want to give us the rundown on why ansel adams is an important name uh Claire? ansel adams was one of the f64 club Group, which were the landscape photographers over in the mid US, and he um, he was probably one of the first ones to do post processing, but he did it in the dark room. But you know, people say, "Oh, Ansel Adams didn't do this; he was a purist, this, that, and the other." But he used to spend hours and hours in the dark room editing his photos by that's right what they call dodging and burning by putting bits of cardboard over things and allowing more light and less light in certain areas of the photo, overexposing it, and he did a whole stack of processing work on his photos. And, whole stack of stuff but he was doing all this sort of he was one of the first ones to go out and photo of yosemite yosemite national park and all these sort of things but he did it in a way that people weren't used to seeing because he was changing his angle he used to drive around in a big van with a he used to climb up on the roof of the van and shoot up from up high and big tripods and things mounted on the roof of his van and he'd travel all over the states just doing all this landscape work there's a whole group of them in this f f64 club they called it yeah because f64 was a Big aperture, so you got a lot of depth of field. Yeah, and 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 you'll see a lot of people talking about what. Um, well, I think you said Ansel Adam, what Ansel Adams did, but they leave out that he really pushed the technology to the limits at the at, at that time by yeah. applying um, really quite arty principles, you know, and and yeah. and. You know, art techniques that are more arty than, um, well, yeah, he's not, he was very definitely non standard in his approach to the yeah. subject, but also to the to the whole process. So, yeah, people used uh, to go out, they'd see his photos and they'd all want to travel out there and they'd go out, they go, but that doesn't look like his photo. That's because he did all his artwork and he did all his processing and he processed the image and got it there, but he also went there for days and days and weeks on end until he got the right light and the right cloud and everything else. Yeah, if you and, go out there and, on a bright, sunny day, you're going to get crap. And would put himself at risk by, you know, climbing uh, dead near dead trees and stuff and getting right to, uh, yeah, to, right to places that, no, like, like yeah. you were saying, some of the landscape photography where he would uh, position himself right on the edge of a crumbling uh, crumbling gorge you know, yeah. where no one else would, would go. Uh, yeah. Um, 100%. Anyway, anyway, we don't have any Ansel Adams shots to talk about, so perhaps we might, we might put, that, uh, put that away. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, well, speaking of sort of landscapey kind of shots, um, even yeah. though the birds are the subject here, um, movement, movement, movement colour, freezing, freezing composition, uh, yeah. uh, rule, rule of thirds. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's nice. So tell, tell us where is this uh, and what can you remember about the shot and which which rig did you have this on? Okay, that's Mount Annan Botanic Gardens, which um, pretty much nearly all the shots. There's a few shots that aren't. 
there's a couple of back shots backyard shots for COVID in there but um most of the shots there are uh, man and botanic gardens what i would have been using for that was probably the back then might have been the 7d mark ii with a sigma 150 to 600 on it which weighs a ton that thing weighs in about four, <laughs> just over four kilos that rig I'm down to half that now, but that's about four kilos, just over four kilos worth of gear I'm carrying for that. Plus a tripod, um, really fast shutter speed. So your shutter speed is up around 2,000, 4,000 of a second. Depth of field will be close to 6.3 or whatever. Um, might be a little bit more to get a little bit depth of field. Usually with rule of thirds, you want in a shot like that, you'd have the rule of thirds, you'd have more space in front of the bird. Yep. Because you usually have where the bird's flying into or running That's into right. the city showing the foreground. But in this case, I've done the opposite way because I'm catching all the splash where he's been. So you've got all that water splashing up as he's running along the top of the water. So these guys are usually running around, they're chasing each other, and they're, you know, male get territorial and trying to chase other males out of their area sort of thing. So they just run or they're either chasing or being chased. So you, you're constantly getting that all day, basically, there, so. You can always guarantee to get that shot if you go looking for it. You'll hear them squeak. Once they do it once, they usually do it a few times. So you get to know the habitat of the bird, the nature of the bird, what they're up to, and you just sort of follow them through. Yeah, coot, coot are really underrated, aren't they? Like, yeah. And if you, you can like... see his feet too, you've got those lobe toes on him too. You can just see the three lobes on each of the feet toes there. Yeah, They've got and, little and... round pads instead of webbed feet. And he's airborne in this shot, even he's though totally he's airborne, totally running on the water. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, it's so I'd be a... doing it in burst mode. So I'd be taking, you know, 10 frames a second, rattling them off. So I'd be going bang, 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 and just tracking the bird and shooting. Yep. Do you, do you think, I mean, it's sort of jumping all around, but the conversation no, lends us to, lends us to that. Yeah. Do you, you, do you think you get the most out of what your camera can offer in terms of uh, things like the uh, the burst and then being able to do like your your stacking in post production? Um, like, are you really pushing your equipment to the limits, or is there a lot left in reserve based on I'm the way usually, you I'm do usually your put in the limits? I usually. Yeah, you know, I usually up, you know, I'll keep a camera for you know it's usually till I've got there's something that I can't use it for. So once I find you know there's something better out there, as in I can get I can on the shots that I'm missing, I'll be able to get with another camera. That's when I'll upgrade. But until I can you know find I'm missing shots, I'll keep a camera for years. The current cameras I've got are four years old. The 60D is over 10 years old now. I've still got the 60D. The 5D4, I still use that. Um, Bowerbird shot was a 5D4. So it wasn't the R5, it was a 5D4 with a 24 to 105 wide angle lens on it. So amazing. Uh, so that wasn't the um, latest and greatest. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, I'm just and the other thing in this shot, too, is the color. Is the color. So you're trying to get your background. So you're separating your subject from the background by colour as well. So try and find for the background, look for different colours to your subject. So if your bird, sometimes you're just going to take a step to the left or a step to the right and you'll change your background colour to try and get a complementary colour to your bird instead of, you know, opposite colours and things so it stands out. Yeah, now um, where will we go next? I just did find the, the one I was talking about that I hadn't, uh, uploaded, which is a, a a nuisance. Look, let's talk gear again for a minute. Yep. Um, Martin says his rig is yep. three point two kilo plus a tripod. Uh, yep. Martin, when you say plus a tripod, you really have to tell us about your tripod. Is it aluminium? Is it steel? Is it uh, uh, carbon fibre? Um, because, you know, tripods can be a kilo and a half uh, on your own. It, now, Glenn's got his gimbal there. You better bring Absolutely. that all a bit closer. Um, yeah. and I'm going to get much closer. I've got desks in the way. 
Yep. Okay, so uh, when uh, when do you need a gimbal, Glenn? <laughs> when do I need a gimbal? When I'm well, shooting when, birds. Well, if I'm shooting birds, I'm nearly always on leaks. Always. Uh, uh, but tripod as against gimbal. That's like that's one of the things when you're looking at uh, um, the. Well, sorry, I just got to take Martin down. Uh, yep. When you're looking at YouTube videos and stuff about photography, and there's a lot of talk about gear, and yep. you, there there seems to be people who are trying to push a gimbal, and there's generally someone with "use my coupon code" or <laughs> talking about how yep. great a gimbal is. But so many people say it's one of the last things that you should add to your kit. So, when did when did you add a gimbal to your uh, bird photography kit? Once I started using long lenses. Okay, Once so it was six, so it was a matter of the balance, mil. the balance yeah. and fatigue, right? Yeah, that's yeah. that and stabilization because a lot of your shots get soft. Once you start getting a really long lens, any vibration or any shake from you is going to bring blur in the image so you're not going to get those really sharp bird shots and holding an 800 mil lens no matter how strong you are you can be arnold schwarzenegger and you're still not going to get an 800 mil lens holding steady and that's a matter of um geometry uh Mm. which is which is one of the reasons why people like me opted after thinking for a long time to go for micro four thirds because I simply did yep. not want to carry weight, that kind of weight, to get the same yep. kind of reach. Um, now, everything is a trade-off, as as we all know. Yep. Yeah, pick, pick up that. That's right. Okay. Yep. That's my current preferred setup. And right. tell full, everyone full what it is. Full frame R5, 800mm lens. Yep. Weight, two kilos. Two kilos, yeah. That's, a, that's good. Yeah. Uh, now you're not get, but I, but I'm thinking you're not going to achieve that for under five and a half grand, are you? No, you are no. certainly not. So yes, no. so um, the lens, so there's the always the, there's always trade offs, isn't there? Um, yeah, the lens is cheap. The lens, uh, what have we got? That lens is probably one of the cheapest. That lens is only one thousand four hundred bucks. Yeah, nobody likes it. Everybody says, "Oh, you can't use that lens; it's horrible." I I use it for about eighty percent of my time. Well, I, this is why where these discussions can get can get good because uh, of all the shots that you've sent me, and you sent me yep. I don't know, 40, 40 odd yep. shots. Yep. Uh, Percentage wise, how many came out of that lens? Now, those shots that I sent you, bird wise, um, probably most of them, a lot of them. Okay, so so there you go. You can't. You cannot take bird shots with that lens because it's really, really crap, right? Yeah, um, because that, it, that lens is an F11 lens. There's no aperture yeah, in it. It's fixed yeah. F11. You can't change the aperture. And everyone says F11 is no good because it's too dark. You can't, you know, you can only shot in, shoot in bright sunlight. That's garbage. I've shot in rainforest environments, undercover and dark. And yeah, but I do use the tripod and the gimbal lens. Yep, and. Uh, well, Naomi's Naomi's next question sort of leads on from that statement, Glenn. But uh, if if you if you know your camera and you know the yep. techniques, you yes. can probably get away with just about any lens in most circumstances. Midnight in the rainforest, probably not. But but like you say. Uh, for most use that's cases, where the, it's good. Yeah, that's where the camera body comes in as well, but because yeah. the camera bodies I've got now is one of Canon's latest and greatest sort of thing, and that I can push the ISO up to ten thousand. Yeah. So I go yes. ISO ten thousand. You know, once you're up that sort of numbers, I can still get usable images. Um, yeah, which um, uh, which I wouldn't even countenance with with no. my camera. So uh, no, you you wouldn't uh, go near that on a no. micro four thirds. No. Uh, so I always use a tripod and gimbal for birds. 
80, 90 percent of the time. Okay, and and that's a that's a stylistic decision and a functional decision yeah. in terms of where you where you are and where you're doing most of your shots. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we always need to. Uh, well, I always like to make sure people understand. You don't have to have what what Glenn's using. Oh, no. The same as oh, you no. don't have to have what what I'm using. The and and to get to get started and to practice and to develop, the best thing to use is whatever you've got. So, Absolutely, uh, you yeah. can do a hell of a lot with what you got. I did a talk in the botanic gardens in the city last year. And the first question that somebody asked is, what camera should I buy? I want to get into photography. What camera should I buy? I said, what camera have you got? She said, I've just got an iPhone. I said, right, where's your iPhone? Yeah. I got it out and I bought out a torch. Yeah. And I said, right, where's your iPhone? I said, you know, you can adjust the exposure on your iPhone. No, I didn't. I said, right, click on the image, drag your thumb down. The exposure goes black. I said, we'll bring in the torch. And all of a sudden we got this picture of a flower, fully lit, like similar to what I do with the mushrooms with an iPhone. I said, do you I didn't know I could do that. So, no. So, That's right, because nobody generally goes past the first page or the yeah. or, or the first uh, lot of controls. So, um, and that and, mm -hmm. and that's. Uh, I mean, Martin's asked about what the lens brand and size was. I mean, you you basically did that, but can you give a yeah. uh, a, 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 re a recap? That's of, a Canon uh, Canon Pure Canon lens. It's an RF body, so mirrorless Canon mirrorless. And Canon have not opened up their mirrorless mounts to third party, so you can't buy a Sigma or a Tamron lens for the Canon RF bodies yet. Yeah. Nikon you can, I think you can, and Sony you can, but Canon, they've tied it down, they put patents on it, and they stopped everyone doing it. So you have to buy their lenses. But that lens is relatively cheap. Yeah. Probably one of the cheaper lenses you're going to get. The other lens I use for birding is this one. That's a bit heavier. That's that's a hundred to five hundred mil. Yep. That's a little bit heavier, but that's um, price wise on that is that's four thousand lens. That's a four thousand dollar lens. Yeah. And is that the same mount for the uh, yep. for the R series? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you're you're not putting older glass that you already had with an adapter on on your new on your new yes. camera. You I are. do. I'm still using the EF macro lens, the 100 mil macro lens. I still use. So yeah. Yep. Yep. But the two birding lenses I've got are both RF now, so I'm using yep. the latest. Yep. Yep. So, um, and and I guess when we're talking talking about gear and adapters and and everything, there is there's a wealth of stuff that's available. I mean, you just hit Amazon or eBay. Uh, oh. And and have a look around, uh, and then go and try try things that you might be interested yeah. out. Um, yeah, a lot of camera shops they do like try days where they have like an event day where you can go out and try different gear and things. Yeah, camera shops or camera brands. Canon used to do it; they don't anymore. But Canon used to have days out where they'd go on a pirate like the zoo before hours, and you go out and try the zoo, the whole van, they turn up with a van load of gear, and you say what you want to try, and they. Yeah, you know, lend it to you for the day, and you go out and try it. Yeah. Well, looking into the future, we are hoping that um, uh, we'll be able to do some photography Friday days like that, probably on Saturdays or Sundays. Funnily enough, yeah. um, where we will uh, get the support of some manufacturers and some uh, and some folk who are uh, experts in uh, in in the in the ecosystem in the brand and. Um, let people get hands on and get an idea of um, the the real world implications of using those uh, 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 those bits of kit. Okay, uh, if you're okay. going to go down that, if you're going to start playing with that, give us a yell before when you do, because I'm also affiliated with a local camera shop here, and they'll be happy to join in with that sort of thing as well. Well, f uh, it might surprise you to know, Glenn, that you're on the shortlist on the whiteboard uh, for <laughs> for Sydney. There's uh, there's a yeah. couple of people on the Sydney, okay. so yeah. it just it's an awful lot of planning to get anything yeah. like that. But no, uh, I'm a I'm a to... local ambassador for one of yeah. the camera shops here. I'm the Can Canon ambassador for that uh, camera shop down this way. So. Cool. Well, uh, look out look out for those 
things, uh, of course, just look out for Photography Friday and the Bird Emergency, and we'll be doing something like something like that. Hopefully, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, yeah. at least in uh, during the year. Um, Naomi says. She does yeah. a lot of bushwalking and the two kilogram lens and camera and water and thermos. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and if you've got a tripod coming with you. Uh, so do you do bushworking, Glenn? And do yes. you generally know or scope out the area you shoot and set up? What yeah, I so, do is yeah. I, I actually carry, I used to have a belt system, right? Like a holster system. And I used to have two cameras. So I used to carry the, Back in the old days, I used to have the Canon 7D Mark II with the Sigma 150 to 600. So that's four kilos on one hip. I'd have the Canon uh, 5, 5D Mark IV with a 24 to 105 on the other hip. And on the backpack, I'd have a backpack full of speed lights. So I'd have all my flashes and triggers and things in the backpack. And I'd carry a camera, a tripod and gimbal head. And that's how I'd walk through the bush, and that's how I travel. And I do that every <laughs> Saturday in the gardens. I walk in the gardens with all that gear, and I just yeah. spend the whole day out in the gardens walking. And I go through all the bush tracks in the garden, so I don't just go to the manicured gardens. Botanic gardens at Mount Annan, biggest botanic gardens in the Southern Hemisphere, 416 hectares of land, half of it's natural bushland, and I just go walking in the bushland because that's where the birds are. Oh, that look Honestly, that would drive me absolutely spare um i i i hate having binoculars and the camera but i don't like only having the camera and not having the binoculars if um uh, that's uh yeah look i don't even know i don't even think my i think i think i got three if i take three lenses two cameras, the yeah. tripod, I don't think I even make three kilo. So uh, Yeah, no, I, you wouldn't with what you got. Yeah. Uh, they're, um, they're yeah. And that uh, – and, 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 and I'm agonising over whether I buy another camera body for – and that's basically for doing interviews, videography, having yeah. – uh, being able to do three cameras in a location – um, yep. and I, and, and I'm agonizing over that cause I'll probably have to get another case, you know, so I'll have to have two cases and a backpack to go on site. I couldn't imagine anything work. Couldn't imagine having five or six kilo of gear in the bush. That would be. <laughs> yeah. But you see, when I get to the bush and I get something, I go, bugger, I wish I had that with me and I don't do yeah, that anymore because well, I have it with me. Well, well that, that's the other thing I'm discovering this now because, there's now so many small portable lights that are available. Yeah. And I know that once I weaken, once I break my rule of one in, one out, I know that the minute I break it, I'll end up with three or four and then another case. And, um, yeah, yeah which is... Uh, yeah. But the, the, other all... thing, the other thing you got to worry about too, because I do do some travel around, so you got to worry about what you can carry on a plane. Yeah, yeah, and that's where... No, and I don't yeah. check in my camera gear. I always put that on the carry-on. Well, that's... <laughs> when I start, yeah. You know, I won't check in... Well, let's try again. I won't check in camera bodies and lenses. I will check in flashes and tripods. They'll go in the bag yep. in the hole, yep. but the lenses and the camera bodies... They stay with me, so I've got to make sure, and a laptop, so I've got to make sure my bags are within the limits. But I've got a hundred. I've got a hundred dollar rule. If it's yeah. if it's under a hundred dollars, if it can be replaced, yeah, uh, that's fair enough. For under a hundred bucks, it go it gets checked in. Yeah. Um, and anything else, I've got a hard cover flight case, yep. and and a uh, backpack, yep. and a and a light, lighter flight case, but I can put the hard the hard flight case and the lighter one, which can only have which lenses and small yep. micro four third body. I can put the two of them in the in the overhead yep. uh, space in the plane, so that works out uh, works yep. out nicely. But yeah, you got to you got to worry about getting stuff yep. 
not not only knocked off but damaged nowadays. Yeah, damage. Um, There's nothing worse than travelling, you know, squillion dollars, paying a fortune for a trip you're about to do and get there and find your gears in bits. Because yeah. half the time, by the time you're out in the middle of nowhere, you can't buy a new gear out right there. Or the other thing, which is more more likely, I think, is that uh, you've arrived in Tangier and your gear is in Atlanta. Yeah. Because that's... <laughs> I think that's yeah. far more likely nowadays than your gear is going to get uh, lost or, or uh, stolen or broken. Uh, yeah. Now we didn't yeah. we didn't put this up, did we? Martin says, yeah, yeah, "What's your thoughts on using a, a yeah. teleconverter on a Nikon two hundred to five hundred uh, yeah. at f eight? Okay, this is you've asked one of my thoughts, so this is purely my thoughts." Um, so, and don't take it the wrong way. I'm not a fan of teleconverters for a couple of reasons. On a whole, usually your images get a little bit softer with a teleconverter, so they're not quite as sharp, but you're also losing a stop of light. So you got a 1.5 or a two times teleconverter, two times you're going to lose two stops of light. 1.5, you lose one and a half, uh, you lose one stop of light. So your F8 then becomes, you know, you'll start losing or oh, that, uh, only able to shoot at f8 yeah so you're losing that um yeah it's one of the trouble with bird photography no matter how big a lens you've got you've never got a long enough yeah, that's right you've never got enough reach <laughs> so yeah you just don't you know, yeah. i'm shooting 800 and you know i can put the body into a crop mode and it makes it longer again in theory but reality is it doesn't do a great deal but um yeah no matter how long your lens you get you're not going to be long enough it just Birds are tiny in the scope of things, and you really can't get close to them at times. And having said that, one of the shots that I had there was taken with a twenty-four to one hundred and five, one of my first shots. But yeah, you can shoot you know, close if you get the birds used to you. Which, going back to the initial conversation, fungi. What I do is I walk into an area and I'll take pictures of mushrooms, and while I'm yeah. taking pictures of mushrooms, all the birds get used. All to the me. birds come in because you've the been there and in. you've been quiet. Exactly, I'm quiet I mean... and I'm sitting on the ground. I'm not standing up overbearing, so I'm sitting on the court ground, mucking around for half an hour. The birds are used to me, and all of a sudden I'm getting half these bird shots. So some of the bird shots that I've sent you, are, there's a fungi shot lined up with it. That's the fungi shot I took, and that's the bird shot I got at the same time. So. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do Photography Friday based on bird stuff because bird craft and yep. bird photography go hand in hand. And if you yep. can get one right, you're going to get better. Uh, you're going to have a better photography experience if you actually do better bird watching. And yep. by better bird watching, I mean not traipsing around and being in a hurry to get everywhere and uh like perfect technique for you glenn sitting down spend half an hour messing around with uh uh with, with a, a a moral mushroom yep. and then all of a sudden the birds are calling and they're close yep. you're not you're not having to go out and find them Especially if you're near water. Now, mushrooms usually are in a wet environment, so the chances are there's water about. The birds are going to come down for a drink throughout the day. So if you're near water, so the things you look for for birds, they're going to want shelter, they're going to want water, and they're going to want food. So if you've got flowering plants, birds are going to come, the honey, honey-eating honey type birds are going to come for the nectar of the plants. If you've got seed plants, they're going to come for the seeds. So if you go you find the plants, you know what's in season, the birds are going to come to that. Mushrooms, water, the birds are going to come to water. So you the, the three things I shoot all sort of work together. All right. Now, people are going to I, – I can hear people screaming, you, where are the photos? Talk about birds. So let's uh, yeah. let, let, let's do a bunch of parrots and uh, and talk about these shots. Uh, yep. One uh, Truly one of the best birds that there is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The scaly-breasted lorikeet. Yep. Um, now, is that a Grevillea superb that it's feeding on? One of the only ones I haven't got the name of the plant with handy. I've got the name oh, of all the other plants. Um, 
Uh, I'm thinking it's sure. a, I'm thinking it's a, a superb, not a Robin Gordon, just simply because of the yeah. more yellowy um, uh, flower. But but I would be happy because depending on the on on what you've done in post production, that could be Bugger a Robin Gordon that too. Yeah, that one, that one's hardly had any post production on that. Okay, didn't need any. So so not a great deal on that. Uh, so I'm probably right in saying it's either a Grevillea Robin Gordon or a Grevillea Superb. Yeah. 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 Uh, I can I can actually have a look. Uh, That's going back to something else we'll cover. <laughs> but um, this one's taken actually in the car park in the gardens. Uh, That's one beautiful. of the few areas that the scaly breasted lorikeets come, and I've only got very few photos of them, but I've only got that the other day, that one. That's when I was uh, and, just walking back to the car and all of a sudden I heard, I heard the lorikeets call and there's rainbow lorikeets about there's a few musk lorikeets and then there's two of these about as well so and he's uh, only standing about two meters away from me and he didn't didn't care and is he he or she because yep. i don't think we can yep. sex you can't. the you scalies can't, yeah. um uh, knee height hip height uh almost shoulder height Oh, okay. So, oh, it, well, then it's a bigger Grevillea. So, probably yeah. a, uh, probably a Robin Gordon that hasn't been really well pruned. I would think. Yeah, no, uh, the the plant got it would have been over over my head. I'm six foot, so it was over yeah. my head in places. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's a decent, decent thing. But there was a whole stack of bottle brushes out too, and that's what they were mainly in the bottle brushes. But these guys were having a crack at the Grevillea, and this was. On the path, just walking into the car park. Um, what lens did you have on? You, I, I think you were mentioning, uh, but I wasn't listening. Would have been the eight hundred mil. Eight hundred mil. Okay. Yep. Uh, Naomi. So I would have actually comment. had to stand back. <laughs> well, uh, that's one of the other things about having big lenses is sometimes you're too close. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, so Naomi said, I know you've been at Mount Annan when there's a crazy race to photograph a particular bird. Yeah, there is. Uh, so this is ethics. Um, yep. uh, Naomi, we we might just put that conversation a little bit uh, back, a li push it back into the, uh, into the future a little bit. But what I did want to... Um, really highlight about being at the at Mount Annan is how closely gardens and birds are allied uh, and that when you are in a public garden setting that bird watching and photography becomes sort of natural um, uh, corollaries like something that you can easily do together even if you do have quite a lot of gear because it's only a short walk from the car park uh, and you don't have to um, scale mountains to get to uh, a good spot for a photo where you know you you're going to find interesting you, you subjects. Can. You can scale mountains there. I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. But, um, yeah, but... Um, the gardens, they've got 197 different bird species in the gardens. So there's a hell of a lot of birds in that garden. You've got different garden areas. So the gardens are divided up probably about five main areas. So you've got natural Cumberland Plain woodland, which is why the garden site was chosen in the first place. The gardens were done in 1988 as a bicentennial project, and the site was chosen. It wasn't half of it was a dairy. It was a dairy farm, but it did have some remnant Cumberland Plain woodland area in it. So that's why they grabbed it to protect that. Because there's only about thirteen percent left of that in Sydney area. So the gardens have got manicured gardens, curated gardens. Plus, you've also got all this natural bushland area. So you got what they call a connections garden, which is mainly the main flower garden where everyone goes to. You got a bottle brush garden, a wattle garden, and a banksia garden as well. And then you've got um, open woodland, open grassland, and all of that brings different birds into the different areas. So the woodland area is where the swift parrots come in winter. So come winter, we usually get swift parrots there, which is what Naomi is alluding to earlier. That, and we had a red-backed king, uh, red-backed, yep, yeah, there we go, little swift parrots. 
So we had that. And once the swift parrots get there, I usually see them before anyone else, and I usually don't say a word because I know what comes after that. Because as soon as that word gets out and somebody puts it up on any bird, you get 60,000 people all trampling through the Cumberland Blade woodland, squashing it down, trying to get their picture of a bird. They don't give a bugger about the gardens or the woodland or the natural environment. They got to get their trophy shot and get out. So, yeah, there's regular people that go birding and they care about what's there. And then there's the ones that come from other places that just don't care at times. Some do, but others don't. Yeah, when we had the red back king parrot, uh, kingfisher in, there was people coming in with speakers, and one guy came in with a twelve inch bloody dinner plate size bloody speaker running around the place. You got to be kidding, guys! Yeah. Oh, and it, what freaks me out ab about that is, I I wouldn't have thought that the red back kingfisher was that unusual for never never been seen in the gardens before. But surely it's not far away that it's recorded. I mean, um, again, I'm going back into my uh, childhood, but, um, uh, Never. you know. I've seen really this part of Sydney that often. Yeah, that, um, that kind of surprises me. I, I, you that's get the sacred... not a, a, it's not a species that was ever on my... Um, sort of oh, hard to hard to see list. Um, just going back to my old book. Uh, I'm pretty sure I saw one. I mean, I know you're not really close to Bathurst, but it's not far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah Bathurst. Yes, yeah, they're usually on yeah. the other side of the range. They're not on this yeah, side of the mountains. So, so what is it? Half hour drive? Bathurst? No. No, Bathurst on Ad the other side of the Blue Mountains. So Mount, Mount Annan's on Sydney side. You got to go over Katoomba yeah, yeah, over yeah, the mountains. But how long is it going to take you to get to get to Bathurst? A couple of hours, about two hours. Okay, so two to three, two two and a half hours. No. But yeah, no. Out the other side of the range, you get them. You didn't usually get them on this side, but this, there's a couple of all of a sudden there's a few of them around the Sydney area, but they were coming from everywhere. He was only in the gardens for six days, but that six days there was all sorts of nutters going on. <laughs> there's one in the afternoon late afternoon he was up on the telegraph pole wires and he's hunting and he's doing his afternoon late forage and there's people setting up bluetooth speakers there the birds six eight foot away from him and they're still putting speakers he's not going to get any closer to you what do you need to attract him for just take know, a bloody you in the first place but take a ride down the bloody hume highway yeah if you see him uh, see him on yeah oh, yeah that i Ethics is a really interesting one, isn't it? Where people will yeah. talk about the ethics of the birds, looking after the birds, but yeah. but you you got to be ethical about just where you are, Absolutely. and 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 the whole tread lightly and yeah. you know one of the yeah. big things in the gardens, people say, yeah, but I'm not squashing the plants. One of the big things the gardens worry about is the pathogens you're bringing in on your shoes. So you don't know where, where you've been because all birders they go out everywhere. Oh, uh, that that's that's right. And uh, one of my one of my uncles once told me, and this was when Phytophthora was yeah. not widely understood to be a yeah. a threat to the eucalypts. Um, that you should have a pair of shoes. Which is your bush work, walking slash bird watching shoes, and they stay yep. outside, and yep. and you put them either in a uh, like a bucket or a tray or a bag yep. at yep. at your door, and that's what you take when you go places. Uh, you don't traipse it all around the city, so that you yep. don't take the pathogens from the parklands and everything that you're walking in and. The, Dog poop and all that stuff back out to the next location you go to. And we now understand even better, you should be, if you're going into somewhere that is a um, uh, an area that might be susceptible to pathogens or might you might traipse pathogens out, you should have some bleach in your car and yeah. a little, and a little 
uh, bucket or tray, yep. you know, a little storage tub, yep. and yep. you put in. Yep. That's right, and you just uh, rinse the bottom of your shoes uh, when you're coming in and out, getting in and out. Yep. So that's it. No, uh, no, Vicky, the shoes I wear in the gardens, I only wear in the gardens. I got yep. one pair of shoes for the gardens, and not, yep. not anywhere else. Yep, yep. the the redback in mudgy, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, no. Um, Martin put up a comment saying there was a lot of rare bird alerts. He's right. Yeah, the rare bird alerts went out everywhere when this thing was in the gardens. I think uh, one of the things that I've discovered when I've been doing the deep dive with Ricky Coglan is. Yep. A lot of times, rare bird alerts are for birds that aren't very rare and really shouldn't have been an alert, and uh, yeah. for the for the region that they've been seen in, um, yeah. it just might be that there are not many uh, records on eBird. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes yeah. it rare, yeah. not that it's yeah. rare. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I yeah recently there's been was it region uh, region honey eaters. Out Penrith Way, I didn't go chasing those. There's been painted snipe around the place. Once again, you know, it's not my area. It's not, you know, every man and their dog goes out there. It becomes a circus act for it. I've seen what it does in my area. I don't want to participate, so I don't go chasing. You know. you're, you're not a twitcher, Glenn. I'm not. I'm a photographer. That's right. I'm a photographer that likes birds. That's yeah. right. You're, I've got a list of birds fan. for the gardens, and I'm working my way through that, but I'm not, not into the other stuff. Well, what, since you brought that up, while yep. we're looking at your shot of uh, red rump parrots, red yep. uh, 197 birds species recorded in the gardens. How many have yep. you managed to uh, capture? Go. Yeah. I've got one, shots of 169 of them. And we're getting close. Getting yep. close. So going back to why you started the podcast and things, I still don't have a sparrow in the gardens. Oh, that's interesting. And, oh, well done for remembering, too. Well done for remembering. Uh, but I did they, used re to, they used to have a restaurant in the gardens, and they've just reopened it again. The restaurant shut for all. When the restaurant was there, there were sparrows there. I, I was then, just going to say, if, the, if they've just reopened it, you're about to get uh, uh, rock doves, uh, house sparrows, and silver gulls as yeah. uh, breeding residents in the garden. Uh, yeah, so. I, it's been open now for probably about four or five months, and so far there's still no no additions come in. Uh, wait, this is wait. one of those, we're going back to this shot then, so this is a more like an action shot. So traditionally, or not traditionally, but a lot of people just get the bird on a stick shot, so, you know, the yeah. background shot where you've got the parrot just sitting on a branch. That's all nice to start with, but then you want something a bit more, so you want something action happening, so. This case, you've got the female coming down. She wants to drink. The male's already on the perch where she wants to get, so she's there having a screech at him, trying to chase him off the branch so she can come in and get a drink. Tail's dragging in the water. Yeah. Relatively fast shutter speed to freeze the action, but enough to keep the blur in the wings so it looks like there's movement still going on. So that's a combination of not getting too fast a shutter speed, but enough to freeze the action of the face of the bird. Face and feet are frozen, but the wings are still got that motion blur to say there's something going on. And the male in the background uh, yep. just makes you realise how closely related a lot of these uh, grass parrots uh, are. I mean, that looks so much like a turquoise uh, as well. It's, yeah, but it's not. Just, oh, oh, look at that. Anyway. We did have yeah. a turquoise there. We had a turquoise there for only half a, a, half a day or a day about four months ago. And I actually got a shot of it too then, but... Yeah, about four months ago, there was a turquoise in the gardens for a day. Very nice. Well, let's whiz straight into another brightly coloured uh, parrot. It's a was. One of the, uh, it is. Was it it is Loz. Uh, and I have to have to tell you too, Loz update, very grumpy today. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's very grumpy today. Um, he's been in and out and had a, had a bath early. Um, but... Shadow and uh, Shadow and Loz got very uh, closely acquainted, and it was going very well. Shadow was sniffing and lock, uh, licking Loz, and I thought, "Oh, this is this is going good." But then he decided he'd like a mouthful of tail, so yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so lo, lo, so Loz is de-stressing out 
outside for anyone who is interested. Yeah. What, that's a, one that's of the most... So this is at home. One of the most commonly photographed yep. birds in Australia, I I would say. Uh, well, and si- most since, common bird in Australia for bird lives count, don't they? Yep, yep. And since I have uh, very close quarters with Loz, with rainbow lorikeets, I have yep. to say they are far more variable in their plumage than I had ever thought yes. before. Yeah. Uh, this one has very little red on the chest and yeah. a very thick green, uh, yellow-green collar behind the head. Yeah, some of them have got like an orange collar on them. Yeah, oh, well, they'd be the red-collared lorikeets. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some, some of the rainbows are getting, you're getting close to a red collar too. Right? Yeah, but Loz has a very thin, pale uh, collar. And more red on uh, on him than this one, but far yeah. less than many other rainbows that uh, that I see around the place. Yeah. Uh, now let's see what if we. This, got, was COVID, uh, this was a COVID lockdown shot when I wasn't allowed out. There we are. Because the area we're in, we weren't allowed to move. You know, very far at all. Not. Well, I, I couldn't get to the gardens. I can see the gardens at me door, yeah. but the gardens were in a different LGA, and I wasn't allowed to go to them. Oh, we we were only allowed to go uh, six six kilometres, which meant I couldn't I couldn't go to my supermarket of choice. Yeah, uh, I don't think, I don't think we could go that far either. Yeah. I think I couldn't get to the Smiths Creek Reserve, which is in my low LGA. I couldn't get to that. There was a whole stack of things. I think it was like less than a kilometre or something. We were allowed to travel. It was bugger all. Oh, it wasn't good. Dictator Dom. I didn't hear anyone going on about Dictator Dom. Uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, now let's ha- let's have a look some more pa- some more parrots. I promise parrots. This is a nice shot. Um, this is a shot build. that's been played with the art effect too. If you look up that top corner, top you can right see all the brush strokes and things like a painting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That one went nuts on social media when I put it out because people said, "Oh, it's a painting." No, it's a photograph of a painting. No, it's they had no idea what it was. But it got all sorts of comments and suggestions and things. So it just generates interest. But the birds, the way I do that, you photograph it, you put it into Photoshop, you process it to give the painting effect, then you mask back in the birds. The birds are just 100% photo, and the rest of it's got more to that arty feel to it. You sort of blend it in. Just gives something to do in night time and just creates different images. But it works in some images. Some images it works, some it doesn't. When people ask how did how you did it on social yeah. media, do you do you do you tell them or do you just let it let the the image speak for itself? It depends. Depends who it is and depends you know what how they're asking and things like that. Some people I'll tell. Other people I say you know come to a workshop and I'll show you. And other people you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll go for it and we'll explain it all. And, you know, depends. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm happy to tell anyone how I do anything. I don't, you know, I've got no secrets. Yeah, most it's not. Time, most times people, you know, people won't go to the trouble of doing what I do. That's yeah, half and, of it. And often people won't ask, uh, go to the trouble of asking you politely how you, how you did it. So, yeah. um, and I just wanted to recognize to Zoe. Uh, Zoe, uh, thanks for popping in. Enjoy the rest of the day. Now, Martin's got a common problem here, Glenn. Yep. that I'm sure lots of people have shared. Um, I find it hard to get a good view of little lorikeets when I'm looking in my binoculars, uh, when when I've got a flock of lorikeets around. You just, I mean, they're so much harder to get yes. a look at than than musk lorikeets, yeah. Uh, yeah, which are the harder than... The up the top. <laughs> that's right, they're so hard. So, Martin, don't... Uh, uh, don't feel like there's any um, failing on your behalf. Little lorikeets are really, really difficult. Uh, yeah. What, and one, because they often aren't vocalising to the same extent as the, the larger lorikeets. And even if they're in a mixed flock, they're just so hard to pick out. They, uh, I think unless they want you to see them, 
you don't see them. You'll see them and hear them flying overhead. That's nearly all of the times that mm. I've got a good look at little lorikeets. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of decent shots of them, but they're yeah, they're not easy to get. As you say, they're always right up the top. They're in the blossoms. You've usually got leaves and sticks in the way. You don't get a clean yeah. shot. You don't get a clean view. But you, you know, over time, you do get them. It just takes many visits and you know, keep looking. But yeah, and, it's, they're not an easy one to get. But Martin, Martin, he, he, there's almost an answer to the quandary just here. Yeah. If you know a spot uh, with uh, where you can see where the where they visit, if yep. there is blossom and you know a spot and they're likely to be there, it's just a matter of waiting until they yeah. uh, until they decide to pay you a visit. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, there's a the gardens have got two spots where the swift parrots come. This year they came around the plant bank in the woodland area, but a couple of years running they were in what they call a banksia garden area, and there's a dam there. One year we had like 120 in the one dead tree at night. They'd all rest in this tree. They had 120 odd roosting in the tree. Well, you had, there's a uh... hill where they are, and you could get straight across shots straight on at them. So you had twenty five percent of the known population. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, with, with with swift parrots, I mean, La Trobe University is a good spot um, uh, to find them in Melbourne. Uh, yeah. But you never know which day they're gonna they're gonna turn up, and you have to be there when the when the right eucalypts are in flower. Yeah, uh, they stay yeah. usually when they come to the gardens. They spend the whole winter there. They were there for months when they were uh, there. Well, it, it it's the top end. It's the top end of the migratory range, really, isn't it? Yeah, so it is. Uh, but usually in the gardens, they, wherever the bell miners are, is where the swift parrots are, because they're both feeding on the lerps. On, on yeah, on on the psyllids and the lerps. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So while uh, while they're there, and they don't go, so that they just set 120 of them odd, but just munching on them for all the winter. Yeah. Whereas down here, you see they're them on the way clear. north, and you see them yeah. on the way south. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. you don't really, and you only can work that out when you know when they've left. Like yep. when they've left Mount Annan, you can probably work out when they might be. Yeah, yeah. how many days uh, it takes to get down there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone, so, anyone that's been in the botanic gardens the last few months, I'll recognise that because they've got that printed on a giant banner as you drive in the gardens. <laughs> About ten foot high, they got that shot. Well, of course, what we're looking at is the. Uh, the Waratah, and yeah. is is this one of the cultivars, or is the because this yeah that's shady shady lady that that is shady lady yeah okay because yeah. it's not the leaves aren't serrated serrated yeah. uh, or um, notched in the same way that the the species are, and also the flower heads aren't as classically terminal. Yeah, but classic Waratah shaped yeah. flower with. One of Australia's most common birds atop. For those who are just listening or are at work and not paying attention, we're looking at a rainbow lorikeet on top of a waratah. Yeah. So what you do is where you got you got flowers like the waratahs, or you got the gums out in flower. A lot of the gums are down low as well. So once you got something like that that's in flower, you know that there's birds going to come to it, whether it be noisy yeah. miners, whether it be wattle birds any of the nectar feeding birds are all going to come to these flower heads. So you set your camera up and you just wait and something's going to come at some stage. So, And it's one reason why people love growing waratahs in their gardens. Yep. Uh, be, be aware that waratahs can become quite large and, yes. uh, and unless you want a large bush, um, <laughs> don't 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 plant one, but they are specky, and well, we've got another waratah shot in a few minutes, so we'll talk more waratahs then. Yeah. Naomi's got a comment here about little lorikeets. She agrees. L little lorikeets are hard. Also, purple crown, purple crown, really really difficult uh, again. But that's also because they're not they're not in the same density. Uh, there's just not as many of them around as as yeah. 
as rainbows. We're we're so familiar with the rainbows. Um, yeah. So in the, in the gardens, the most common is rainbows, followed by musk. There's musk there all year round. Rainbows all year round. Little lorikeets following the flowers, so you get those a couple of weeks. And scalies are very rare as well. Yeah, and again, scalies sort of at the southern end of their yeah. um, regular range. range. Uh, yep. Where and and yeah, the little lorikeet and purple crown are very definitely still blossom migrants. Whereas uh, the the musk is still i only see it as a visitor following the blossom in my part of melbourne but i do i do know in some parts of melbourne it's pretty much a resident now yes so yeah, the re residency so that's seems to be what's happening with with the rainbows is that they have adapted to become resident thanks to uh the the native garden craze of the 1970s, I would think. Yeah. Uh, yeah Gravillia took off, and so did they. That's right. Well, Gravi yeah, Gravillias and Banksias, I think, when when everyone and and ha and Hakias, uh, when yeah. when when Hakia Lorena became a popular Eastern Australian plant, I think that helped them out a lot too. Um, yeah, more parrots. This one's this one's a beauty. Um, it I, is. Yeah, I mean, you've got the diagonals and you've got the the upright plant form. Yep. And then the the eastern rosellas facing each other. Um, yeah, and the angles to them opposite sort of thing to the that's branches. Right. And yeah, that's right. It, it all works. The geometry of that works really, really, really well. Yeah. Now, I did want to ask you about how you lit this and how you achieved the background on this shot okay lighting's natural so there's no lighting yeah the birds are quite a way away so that, that shot's been heavily cropped so the cro shot's been cropped in so the composition that helps because i've actually cropped it to suit the composition this is with the 800 mil lens so to get creamy backgrounds you've got several ways of doing it you can have a small aperture, so like F4, yep. if you've got an F4 lens, good luck if you've got that, yep. $30,000 lens. But yep. So if you've got a small aperture, the smaller the aperture, like a small number, the shallower the depth of field. The other way you can do it is the distance, the U to the subject and the subject to the background. So that ratio, the further the background is, the more you're going to get the background out of focus. So in this That's case, right. that so background's a grass hill quite a way away the birds are probably about 300 meters away they're a fair way away the birds are about 300 meters away but the hill to the birds is probably yeah. another 600 meters away yeah. from that I, I was going to say so you so you'd want that to be 500 between 500 yeah. and a thousand meters away to get that kind yeah. of uh kind of it just goes cream pure yeah. cream yeah 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 um so um, you have to understand how to apply what your gear can do to yes. to get you some of got the... limits and you've got to work to those limits and then work what yeah. you can do. Photography yeah. is very much problem solving. You've got yeah. a problem, and... how do you solve it? And that's what photography is about. Yeah. And, and why yeah. having a discussion like this can be useful because often you'll hear people talk about how they did it and they'll just race through it whereas that idea yep. that that the the distance between you and the rosellas is ideally half the distance between the rosellas and the background, and the background. Yep. Um, but that only works to achieve a background like this depending on the uh, lowest f-stop that you can achieve yeah. with the with the lens you got with the correct exposure so correct uh, now this lens that i've got like i say it's an f11 there's one aperture there's no yep. aperture in it yep. and everyone says oh you can't get creamy backgrounds yeah well there's an example you can yeah no, you absolutely can if you uh uh i mean yeah. the, the way i generally that. do i mean the way i generally do 
photos, I would be saying, I don't get creamy backgrounds. But not because you can't. It's because I don't put myself in the situation with the gear that I am using to get it. That's It's not that you can't do it. It's just that one thing has to equal the next thing has to equal the next thing. Uh, and the other thing is, do you always want a creamy background? No. There's a lot of, lot of photographers out there that do that no. all the time and go, well, it just looks like it's taken up, you know, up against a white wall or a cream wall. I mean, um, uh, if you're watching YouTube and and uh, for YouTube photography channels or anything, and uh, how how do you how do you spot a wanker? And that is you count the number of times they say bouquet balls in in a thirty <laughs> minute gap and. Uh, and, and and there's an inverse relationship between non dickhead and frequency of bouquet balls. Uh, yeah. It's just it yeah. it's um, it's unreal. It's unreal. It's unreal. Yeah. Now let's see hey, John. for another another parrot. You got have a you comment got... from John Hardman. He's a oh, guy I haven't running jumped in for a minute here. All right, let's go. Well, first we've got oh first let's talk process. Um, because this is very, uh, very photography nerd in the wor- in the weeds yeah. comment here, Vicky. Well done. Hi, Glenn. Do you use back button focus for your bird images? Yes, yes I use back button focus for all my images. Um, yes, one hundred percent. Let let let's throw it back on, on Vicky Vicky for a minute. Vicky, how many focus? How many function buttons have you got on the back? And and have you assigned all of them to a custom use? That's <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, well. Going one step further, I actually use a thing called double back button focus. <coughs> so I've got several buttons on the back, and I've got yep. one button that does focus, and it just grabs the you know, the matrix of focus yep. and grabs everything. Everything. Yep. The second second button does eye detect focus, so I only detect okay. the eye of the subject. So yeah. I've got double back button focus. So for birds, I'll usually use that. For plants, I'll use the other. But sometimes birds that won't pick up the bird straight away. So you start with the first button. Once it's found the bird, then you use the second button, then it will go to the eye. Well, my camera doesn't have eye detect. So no, I so I use the, uh, yeah. the 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 single area, but. Yeah. But I've also got a uh, when I'm wanting to take plants and maybe uh, like flowers and maybe a bird in in a plant, I've got the multi spot um, yeah. bit. So I've got a different uh, back button assigned to either one of those too. So yeah. Yeah, same, and, same, same, and, yeah. and and one on the top. Uh, but yeah, there's too yeah. many. I've got one that I haven't assigned anything to yet. So. Yeah, I've run out of buttons. I need another button to assign things to, but that's all right. <laughs> no. Oh, you just need to buy a new camera, mate. Okay. Yeah. Um, so John yeah. has said there was a flock yeah. of 15 to 20 rosellas last night uh, feeding on the grasses here at Mount Annan. Now, yeah. am I assuming that it's only the eastern rosella that you're getting at uh, at Mount Annan, or does the crimson turn up as well? Crimson's there, but the crimson's only in the Banksia garden corner of the garden. So there's one corner of the garden the crimson come in. The rest uh, of the gardens you never see them. So there's just one uh, area. So if you get a crimson, I know where it's going to be. It's going to be in that bottom corner. So but, um, right. the east ends are everywhere. Denser planting there, and woodland, natural woodland, more okay, than the so... curated gardens. Okay, so. So the density is not is not a factor. It's more the character of the uh, of the habitat. Yeah, probably. So you've got the banks here. You've got a lot of firewheel trees down there as well. Okay. Um, and gums, natural gums, and things around the place down that end. So yeah, yeah that that uh, that's interesting because um, uh, again, it's you, you have you place yourself back to where where you grew up and and where we had crimsons and. And Eastons, and yep. the Crimsons would be in. Uh, it wasn't really associated more with uh, eucalypts or or any species, but the density of the of the cover, we would find more Crimsons, and when there was more grass, uh, 
whether it be open or whether it be taller grasses, that's where we would find yep. the um, uh, the easterns. So if there was a sh an intermediate shrub layer, crimsons would be there. Where it was grass, easterns would be would be out there. Um, long time since I've been to Mount Annan, so I've got to come and uh, uh, come and scout it out again. Yeah, it's um, changed a bit. And it's grown up a lot. All the stuff before is you could see all concrete. Now it's all massive plants and things. It's, it's well, big difference. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to yeah. to visiting again. Um, John, tell us what you what rig you're using. Um, how how do you deal with skittish birds, and also that um, uh, that light at dusk? I mean, seven p.m. You at this time of year, that probably is bang in that sort of golden hour light. Um, yeah, you've probably got another half hour before you get to that. Half an it's hour. getting dark okay. about eight, 10 past 8, so okay. it's getting... So you've still got a bit of light at 7. Okay. So, yeah, John, if, you, if you'd if you like to, just tell us how you, uh, how you set up for skittish birds. Uh, what do you do with your shutter speed and... Uh, uh, and your and your aperture, aperture and, and your ISO, mate. Uh, <laughs> are you on the A or the M, mate? <laughs> uh, there we go. We nearly slipped into photography wanker talk. Um, yeah, Naomi says the um, yes. bouquet obsession is annoying. Um, only BBF. Back so is it back button function focus is signed. Um, mm. Naomi, I did ask at the beginning at the beginning that you can throw in what you would love to get. 3D tracking that works, eye detection, and perhaps a uh, a, a Z9 or a Z9. Uh, yeah. Staying in the in, in the Nikon uh, in the Nikon family there. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go back one from the Z9. Go to the Z8. Z8's the one for birders, I think, more than the Z9. Um, that's the one that Georgina Styler changed from Canon to Nikon for the Z8. And that's what she loves with. So okay. I would, if you're going to go mirrorless, look at the Z8 rather than the Z9. Uh, smaller, it's lighter, and it's got just about the same functionality of the Z9. It's just a bit smaller. There's not much that you can't do that the Z9 does. I think it does everything. I think it does, does some things better. So it's smaller and lighter. I'd look at a Z8 rather than a Z9. Yeah, I'm I'm almost four models behind uh, with with my main camera. Yeah. Uh, with to what's uh, about to be released. Yeah, well, and the new one. So, was out the other day. And so far, there is uh, uh, there is nothing in terms of the bodies that. I think I need. Oh. Uh, I'm certainly will would be buying a few more lenses before I would look at another body. And then by the time I want another body, I'll be able to get something secondhand, which is a good step up from where I am. Yep. And it will still probably have functions that I won't get to. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, no, al always spend money on glass before a body. And and for me, unless I'm looking at something which is just for video work inside, like doing interviews with people inside, yeah. everything everything has to be weather sealed. So, um, does it? For, well, for for me, for me, I think so because I'm I'm so often out early in the morning and drizzle just comes. You just get drizzle yeah. and. Uh, yeah. That uh, big lens, the eight hundred is not weather sealed. I have that out in the rain. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have said body. My body has to be yeah. camera body because stuff just gets in. Um, yeah. So you ever you ever stay in a hotel? Uh yeah. Right. And when you go in the shower, the shower caps. Uh. Little plastic yeah. things clear. Yeah. I'll grab them and put them on the back of your camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've got it. I've got a big zip 
zip seal bag. I've yeah. got half a dozen of them that that sort of I use uh, for that as well. But yeah, you just uh, throw a shower cap over the top of the camera or whatever, and you can see through it. You can still shoot through it. You can work all the buttons. If you ever go out pelagic tours out in the ocean and things like that, it stops the salt spray getting on it. Yeah, it's cheap. I just, it works. I just like the thing that you don't you don't have to think about. And and look honestly. I don't, I don't think for the, yeah, I don't think for, for what I selected this camera for, um, I don't think there's actually a non-weather sealed one in the range uh, that so. does what I, yep. that I want. But I wouldn't, I would never buy a, well, if someone would like to, uh, let me try out a brand new one and everything. I would I would be happy to have a new one, but I'm I'm never spending five grand on a camera ever. So, um, yep. but I will happily receive one and use one and talk about one. <laughs> so, um, uh, let's see. Vicky's coming out to see you, Glenn, on uh, out to the gardens again. So, yeah, uh, that. And you can no, talk no. about BFF to your heart, heart's content. <laughs> uh, John, thanks for doubling up with your uh, your thought. Well, there you go. You've got one of those great camera Tamron one hundred to four hundreds Z six Mark two. Well, yep, that's a bit of a ripper. Is I mean, it is. nothing right. wrong. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's only what four years old, isn't it? Um, yeah, they're talking about bringing out a Mark III shortly, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw around a thousand. Well, yeah. Um, pretty good. Slow movements when approaching back, back, and back, back button, back button, not back bucket, back button focus. And the last yeah. light, and the light last, last night, night yeah, was, was reasonably pretty, pretty good. bright last night. Um, John, do you, do you use a flash? at all or are you completely unlit do you take a uh, reflector of any sort or anything out with you as well that's a question for you too glenn do you have a uh, one of those pocket ref uh, zip out reflectors no not not for birding no. not for birding you use very for occasionally your... occasionally very occasionally i think i've only got two shots where i've used flash on birds on a whole i don't I don't use flash on birds on a whole. Um, when I do, the bird's quite a distance away, and then it's just sort of doing a bit of fill flash in daylight, so you've got bright daylight, a bit of fill flash if the bird's in a bit too much shadow and it's not. But the one up behind me, that was done with a bit of flash. That's on the river down Camden, which I think you've got a copy of that there as well. Yep. It's magic. There's a little bit of flash used on that. Mainly it's underexposed. The bird was in the sunlight, so it did... But it's just a little bit of fill to take out some of the shadows from where the bird was shadowing itself. Most of that yeah. normal light and just the sunlight on the bird in the background in the dark. And that's more than rainbow, anything else. Rainbow B eater. So uh, yep. distance from you to the bird and what lens did you have on? Distance from me to the bee eater would have been maybe about 100 metres if that. He was relatively close. Down Camden, that was before the bridge got washed out. Um, lens, probably the 800. Very cool. Very cool. Now, John has told us that he doesn't have a reflector for birding, but can use for flora or still photography. Yep. Yep. Fabulous. And Martin has a question. Uh, yes, very much so. Yep. Exactly, Martin. Okay. Yes, if you go in a live view, you, you've turned your camera into a mirrorless. Exactly. Uh, there we go. Um, do we need to expand on that for for the greater conversation, or is that enough for Martin and you to have uh, um, We can expand on it a little bit more for those that want to get into technicalities. Um, old cameras, DSLRs, digital SLR. So an SLR's got a mirror that bounces up and down in the way of the shot. Um, isn't mirrorless much the same? Yeah, same shooting too. So um, you got a mirror that bounced up and down. The trouble with the mirror, uh, mirror when you're using a mirror, you're using the 
only using certain um, shutter uh, focus points and things. Whereas once you've got a mirrorless, you're usually using the whole sensor. So when you go in the case of a DSR and you use live view using the whole sensor, you basically turn your camera into mirrorless. You get a lot more sensor points, uh, focus points. You get a lot more control. You can see what your exposure is. So the advantage of a mirrorless camera is when you look through the viewfinder, you can actually see the exposure. So as you adjust the exposure, you can see what you're going to get. So the same thing is when you go into live view, you can see the exposure on the back of the camera. So rather than just trying to guess. So when you in the old days when you had film cameras and that, you didn't know what your exposure was. You got a little meter that down below. And sometimes you have to underexpose or overexpose depending on what you're shooting. The meter would say it's going to, you need so much exposure. And you had to guess how much you had to under and overexpose. Mm. With a mirrorless or live view, you can actually see what your exposure is and you don't have to guess anymore. So that makes it so much easier. The mirror, modern mirrorless cameras have got something called eye detect. So you can actually detect the eye of the subject. The DSLRs, when you go to live view, you're missing out on that. So that's one thing you do miss out on. So there's some functionality you're missing out on, but you certainly get the exposure benefit of a mirrorless camera using live view, except you've still got the sun glare on the back of that screen. So you've got to sort of cover the screen to stop the sun glare. So you're not going to see it as well as looking through a viewfinder. So there's a few, it's not quite as good, but it's, it's halfway there. It's not bad. So just to exp extend yep. the main point that I take from that discussion or that I think we can take from that little bit of the discussion, if you're buying a new camera today, yes, is there any reason that you would choose a DSLR over a mirrorless? No, apart from cost. Yep. Yep. The only thing is if you buy, if you're going to buy in the old system these days, they're not making any new lenses. Yeah. They're starting to pull the cameras out, so they're starting to lose support. Yeah. You're going to lose your lenses. They're, all the new developments going into the mirrorless ranges. You're going to buy, you're buying into old technology. Yeah. So, if you're going to buy a camera now, I would seriously be looking at mirrorless. You, know, you can buy cheaper cameras. So, if you're on a budget and everything else, the lenses are still great. You know, lenses I used you know, ten years ago are still good. They're still taking great shots, but. The newer lenses are faster autofocus. They're usually sharper focus. You are getting a bit better technology. And the mirrorless cameras have got more technology in them. And you're buying into a system that will be ongoing support and ongoing lenses coming. Whereas the DSLRs, they're not going to make a new lens. They're not going to come out with a new design lens for those cameras now. Yeah. And that, and that was why the key framing in that question was new. If you're yeah. going to buy a new camera. Exactly. Uh, Get yep. get the newest you can. Uh, yep. Get on the current systems. Um, yeah. But secondhand, love it. And oh, like absolutely. you just said, like you just said, you can have a if you've got a good twenty year old lens and it does the trick for you. Yep. That's a great lens. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Uh, if it if it does the trick for you, it's a great lens. I do a few talks in camera clubs. I do I do garden clubs and I do camera clubs. One of the things I do at the end of the tour is I put up a series of images and I say, okay, we've all had our talk about everything. There, there's a shot. I'm just putting Here's up a, a series of, of images. I use. <laughs> Here's a list of cameras I use. Here's a list of um, lenses I use. What did I take it with? Yeah. Did I take it with the 10 year old one? Did I take it with the latest one? Did I take, and they can't tell. Yeah. I say, well, well, if you can't tell and you've got the image blown up big here, so this is on a big screen, and you can't tell which camera I've used, why do you need to go chasing the latest and greatest? If you can't afford it or anything, you can still take great shots with the old gear. And they can't yeah. they can't pick it. No. Well, most people can't pick a lot about a shot. No. The, the, and, and less people are real well-traveled, yeah. well-seasoned, professional professional level and i don't mean because you don't have to yeah. be a working photographer to be really really good yeah. uh and and you've worked in lots of systems most people can't tell the difference and what? then most people can't tell what was done in camera and then what was done in lightroom oh, yeah, or, exactly. or 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 yeah. in after effects or, yeah. or something yeah, like that so, or whichever you use uh, yeah. which is another yeah. reason why we're having this show because 
there's a lot of bullshit being talked 100%. out there uh, yeah. in in the aid to sell something. And uh, yeah. look, I mean, you can look at pictures of flowers uh, like like the hakia, or the yeah, ancient hakia. Yep, or like the yeah. uh, Cert Desert Pea, and gee, uh, I can't remember the genus now, but Formosa, uh, what was yeah. it? Um, uh, it was Swainsona, wasn't it, yeah. for a while? Yeah. But it's not any longer, I don't think. Is it um, not? I think it is. I think it yeah. still is. Oh, well, well, maybe it still is. Okay. Yeah. Um, but like, oh, look at all those photos. Uh, now, which one was taken with the new lens? Which one was taken with the old lens? Uh, exactly. Which one? Which one was on uh, manual? Well, we know you did them all in in manual. They're all, they're but, all in manual. But you know, yeah. In in most cases, um, you couldn't tell. So much of it is done in the camera, um, yep. and most cameras that are you know less than five years old that are in the uh, top two price brackets will do just about everything you need. Absolutely. Most cameras can do more than what most people are going to ever can ever use. Do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, Most people are never going to use a tenth of what their camera can do. Yeah. Because your cameras are designed to do just about every situation. Yeah. I do birds. I do flowers. I do you know, mushrooms. Okay. That's great. I don't do people, but you know, the camera's set up to do a whole stack of things for people. I don't do yeah. motorsports and things. It's set up to do all that, you know, all that stuff. That I don't use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Although some of the motorsport features are great for birds in flight. That's oh, uh, absolutely. So yeah. yeah. Um, now Martin's question uh, would like to upgrade from the D seventy one hundred. So on the Canon system. Um, no, Nikon. Oh, Nikon. Beg your pardon. Yeah. But there's the devil in the detail. <laughs> yeah. A any suggestions, Martin? Do you want a new one? That's because uh, that's going to be a big part of budget. Um, I would certainly be looking at the Nikon Z range purely because if you buy an adapter, you can still use some of your old glass on it. You do need an adapter. Your old glass won't fit on the Z, same as the Canon R. You have to have an adapter. But you buy the adapter and you can keep. So you start upgrade your body first and you can start getting your lenses later on if you're on a budget. So start with that. So work your way through it. But I would um, be looking at the Z range. Um, there's cheaper Z range. The sheets, yeah. In all of them, there's cheaper. Um, Z6. There's a new one coming out. A Z6 Mark III coming out. So if you can hang off a little bit. This year's an Olympic year. Olympics in Japan. All the camera brands bring out their new cameras for the That's Olympics. Right. And and then and then. Six months after the Olympics, there will be a flood of second-hand gear available exactly. on eBay. <laughs> well, so. usually about now, as people are starting to sell their gear, we're getting ready because they know prices are going to drop later on. So people are starting to sell second-hand gear now, knowing that the new gear is coming for the Olympics. So you know, if you get into the second-hand stuff, now's the time to start looking. But um, I'll have a look at some Nikon stuff. If you hit me up and message me or whatever, I'll have a look. But, um, yeah, Z6 and things like John's been playing with, something like that. But yeah, I'd have a look at the mirrorless Z range. Work out what's... First thing I'd do is grab the camera. If it's not comfortable in your hands and it's too small, because some of the cheaper ones are a bit smaller, if it's too small for you, you're not going to use it. Mm. You're going to pay, you know dollars for something that doesn't fit your hand right and if it's not comfortable that's the first thing i tell people when you're going to buy a camera grab the camera and hold it in your hands is it are you comfortable with it can you use the menu system you can learn how to use it but if you're not comfortable with the ergonomics of it you can't change that that's physical the physical form of the camera so if you can't physically hold the camera comfortably for several hours in it to go really you know you might need a bigger hand. If you've got bigger hands, you want a bigger camera. If you've got bigger, smaller hands, you might want a smaller camera. And and that's where it's important to hold it, but also see with yeah, both hands. Uh, yes. Yeah, use reaching all the buttons and yes. how where you where you might assign functions. Because yes. some cameras, I have only recently become aware of how how many crazy places they put buttons on the front of the camera. Yes. 
that yeah. you you have to be a contortionist to reach, um, yeah. and 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 I I didn't really realise it until I started seeing all these fairly recent cameras for sale on on eBay, and then and then I went and read some reviews, and they were all talking about the placement yeah, of those yeah. function buttons yeah. that they were yeah. just impossible to uh, to reach. Yeah. If you were trying to get manual focus on a tripod, but then you were trying to do do this yeah. to reach a button. So, yeah. no, yeah. Canon when they went their first mirrorless camera they bought out, they actually flew me up to Cairns. So I got a three, three tried up to Cairns, and I got a full day using the camera. All oh, nice. At the end of the day, my hand kept cramping up trying to use the buttons. Yeah, they had this stupid sliding slide bar, which was a bit of a gimmick sort of thing. But to do that, they pushed all the buttons over the far side. You grab the camera and your thumb was right over the far side and if you're using your camera like that all day, your hand cramped up. And I could, every time I'd use it, my hand cramped up. It was just no good, guys. No, you, you didn't buy one. No, I did not. <laughs> no. No, I thought, uh, no, I stuck with the old mirror technology rather than mirrorless because it was just horrible to hold. If I'm going to uh, use that, you know, when I go out shooting, I'm using it all day. You know, I do Saturdays and Mondays all day with a camera and then my other times throughout the day, other days, but two days solid with a camera, and if it's your hands cramping up, it's no fun. You're not going to use it. Now, following on for uh, a helpful tip for Martin, yeah. uh, John says the adapter for the Nikon works really, really well. well. Yeah. Um, so that is great. And Nate, the only... adapters, all, the adapters are on his spaces. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Adapters just for for lens adapter, and then you've got all your um, other. Yeah, yeah. Others. There's no there's no glass in the adapters, so you're not losing yeah. stops of light like you are with teleconverters yeah. and things. It's just purely the space because with a the mirrorless, there's no mirror in the camera, so the flange distance got closer to the sensor. So as a result, you still got to push your lens out further because the lens has got the focal focuses still for the old flange mount. Whereas the new mirrorless lenses are designed for the body, so you don't need the adapter. The adapter, all it does is just push the lens out further, back to where it should be. Have you got any old glass that you uh, have adapted with anything like a, a speed booster onto? No, uh, I've never, never used body? a speed no. booster. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I was only going to have one comment about that, that often yeah. often they're about half the price of, of the lens you want, so just yeah. save up for the lens you want. Yeah. Um, so Naomi's got another one of those. Uh, the 850 is uh, probably the best camera that Nikon bought out before they went mirrorless. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's great cameras out there. If yeah. you, yeah, the uh, D50 is probably the best camera they had. Yeah, it was a it was an amazing camera for Nikon. Yeah, and they uh, sold heaps of them, and everyone loved them that had them. And so, if they sold heaps of them, that means there's heaps of glass out there. So yeah, well, yeah, there's yeah. plenty of Nick, Nikon and Canon had heaps of glass. There's, yeah. there's no shortage of that. Yeah, and and, and people will they're... be selling their glass now because they're buying yeah. the mirrorless. They'll so, either be adapting it to start with, but eventually they will convert over, and when they convert over, they'll sell. Uh, so that means there's going to be lots of uh, Sigma, Tamron, uh, yeah. Seven Artisans. Uh, there's so much stuff out there. So yeah. Um, yeah, all right. Let's whiz through. A, let's have a look at some more. Uh, I'll whiz through a few of the plant picks. Let's just yeah. have a quick look at some of them because these uh, are these all or well, this series of three. Yeah, are, are they all? Oh, where are we? All done or created in a similar way with yes. your lighting yeah. and so all the same ways. I like the mushrooms. I like the plants. Okay. So they're all taken in daylight. That one's in full sun. Oh, so taken sun, in full please. sun, bright sunny day. That one's right beside the visitor centre in the main flower bed, you know, going between the car park and the visitor centre. But the lighting I've tried to use, and I use that a lot of the time, is you go back to, you go to art galleries and you look at the old master's style painting, and I'm trying to replicate that style painting because those paintings have been around for years and people love them, so you've got to be something right with that lighting. So I'm using that style of lighting, but I'm creating it with me off-camera lights. So with flowers, I usually use two lights because I've only got two ends. 
cameras on a tripod, usually put the camera on self timer, and I hold the lights one in each hand. Whereas mushrooms, the lights are on the ground, so I can use a third light. So you would call this uh, uh, Halicrasum de Vermeer. So uh, looks very much in a Vermeer style. Yeah. Um, but once again, you can see that all the textures in the petals. This is the pink funnel flower, but you've got all the textures coming because I've got that side lighting. So the lights are on either side, and that's what's giving the shadows to give all the textures. So all the textures in the petals, because you can't normally see all the textures in petals half the time, but once you start playing with side lighting, you're bringing all that up. On this shot, and yep. as you said, it's a flannel flower, it's really evenly exposed across... Yes, Both this sides. one is compared to the previous shot. Yeah, yeah, so does that mean you've set, you've got the light on the right and the left set the same? Same power and the same distance. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Because uh, distance, whereas... plays, distance plays a big part in your lighting too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this one, um, yeah. this looks to me like it's... Uh, Blue Barry Ash? Uh, Elia Carpus, yeah. So yeah. only... Exactly. But is this only one, uh, one light? No, it's two lights, but one light's on a lot lower power. Okay. Because right. if I only have one light, the light on the right hand side, the light on the left will be almost in full shadow, like the background is. I thought you might have lit this only from the front and no. slightly from above, looking no, at no. it. But it, no, what one from... light is one light is slightly to the above on the right. Yep. And the one on the left will be just straight on from the left. Uh, yeah, just a bit yeah, of a fill yeah. light, just to fill in some of the shadows so you're not getting yeah. all dark. Yeah. Um, and once again, I'll use the light to isolate the subject so the subject's isolated from the background and all the foliage. And getting the fringing on the petals uh, like that was really... Uh, yeah. Uh, it's really nice. Which uh, goes back to the volunteer project I do in the gardens. So what I'm doing in that is I'm photographing the complete collection of the gardens, all of species, about 18 shots per plant species. So these are the pretty sexy shots, but all the rest are more documentary style for all yeah, the horticulturalists to identify uh, a plant. Uh, so, uh, so you have to have botanical images and then yep. horticultural images. Yeah. Uh, so, really, so it's a really picture good. of the leaf, picture of the leaf top, yeah. leaf underneath. The leaf structure, so we've got two leaves, three leaves of so this yep. leaf structure. Yep. Bark textures, the root base, how the roots come out, um, the branches, etc., etc. And we do about 18 shots for every plant. And I and put them here. on a hard disk and I swap the hard disk over with the gardens every couple of weeks when I go in and they upload them into their database. Fantastic. Now, the, tell us about this shot. Yeah, Kenya. Western Australian Kingia grass tree. That's natural light. Winter, winter light. About four o'clock, you're getting back backlit plants in the gardens in certain areas, so you can get all the lighting effect naturally. So that's a backlit natural light shot in the gardens of the Kingia. Costa went nuts when he saw that because yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not surprised, and I. I I thought that might have been a morning shot, but you're telling me that's an afternoon shot. That's late afternoon, about four o'clock. Yeah, yeah, gardens yeah. in winter shot at five. At four, four thirty, you're starting to get in that corner of the garden. You're starting to get the last of the light coming in before it goes between a bit of a hill up the top of the connections garden. So, really, yeah. really nice. Now, but that's, uh, you just got to learn to you learn to look for light. Same with the birds, you can look for light. Yeah. You can get shots like that for birds in the afternoon or morning. Yeah. Really, for birds, you want the morning because afternoon you're starting to still got heat haze in your lens, so you're starting to get soft images, and that's quite often from the heat haze, the heat coming through. So that heat haze gives you a soft image. So it's not always focused. Sometimes it's just the haze, the mirage effect coming off heat. Yeah, and Naomi appreciated that uh, that shot. Yeah. Um, now. I think you did talk a little bit about uh, earlier how you set up your extra lighting. Um, yeah. But I'll bring up a couple of shots and maybe we can talk about how you've yeah. set them up. Because it's different the way you do your flowers than, than the way... Yeah. Well, I don't think any of the... You haven't really got extra lighting on any of the birds, have you? 
I think you were. Uh, the bee eater was the only oh, one. Oh, the bee eater, was, this yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, this one. That one, a little, little bit of fill flash, but none of, all the rest are natural light for the birds. Okay. So no so lighting just, used on the birds. So um, so we'll just that, run through a light. few of them yeah. that quickly. That's got that uh, painting effect. That one's done like Monet style. So you've got water lilies, so I've used Monet style. Oh, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so that works, and then the bird, bird's brushed in, so the bird's more pure photo, and then the yeah. background and everything else is more like the mono, so the bird's sort of sitting in a painting. Yeah, very definitely um, uh, more effect on the water lilies than on the grasses. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you just yeah. brush it into different strengths. Um, so I'll have a look. Oh, here we go. This is a this is a ripper. We'll come back to some flowers in a second. Sure. Um uh, for you, Mark. Australian Martin. hobbies. Yeah. They nested nested on top of a power one of those high tension power poles. They nested there for three years, and they cleaned out all the small birds in that area. There used to be tree tree martins there. There's no longer. I was going to say, is that a tree martin? That was my yeah. that was my guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They 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 went through tree martins first, then they started doing red rumps and swallows and things. East uh, welcome swallows, but. Three martins were the first to go. They must have liked the taste of them better than everything else. Yeah. Or they were Although, easy to catch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they just wiped through those. That's the male bringing the female his gift. Yeah, they, and there's quite a significant size difference, isn't there, between yes. those two birds? Yes, um, yeah, males really, are much smaller than that. It's really yeah. quite evident. Uh, yes. Evident there. Um, yeah. yeah, they nested in that spot for three years and they cleaned out everything there. And how far from from the birds were you for that shot? Probably about two hundred meters. Okay, so that's a long way away. Yeah, it's been oh, cropped that's... in. The image is starting to break down, but not quite. But yeah, it's oh. eight hundred mil lens comes in handy. That's right. I mean, that's uh, uh, that's more than a, a a full soccer pitch yep. away. That's that's almost a full footy field. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's getting close to it. Yep. yep. They're high up in the tree too, so if you get too close, you're starting to look up from it, so you need to go back a bit to get that straight-on sort of shot. Yeah. That's the other issue you've got to try. You try. You don't always want that shot underneath because all you're doing is getting the bird bum shots. Yeah, so you really want... Right. Yeah. yeah, the the, uh, the yeah. vent shot. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, as I was promised, uh, going back to some flower and you can talk about some lighting yeah so that uh, yeah going, going back to martin's question so cameras on a tripod so the cameras on a tripod i put the camera on 10 second self timer that gives me 10 seconds to reach go around and use the lights so i've got two lights both in small soft boxes so a small soft box disperses the light more spreads the light makes the light source bigger so it softens the light so when you see model shots so you see people taking pictures of models they use these big white boxes with the lights inside it and it just softens the light that's what i'm doing with these flowers so taken in daylight normal sunlight underexposes the shot basically the back background then using the lights to sculpt the light side lights each side so i'm reaching around so i've got one light in each hand arms are basically full stretched wrapping around trying to avoid getting in the camera shot and this, after the 10 seconds, the shot fires, and I go back and have a look, adjust the powers accordingly until I get something right. So that's a bat wing coral flower. Um, tell us more about about that. What we, uh, Birds love it. The lorikeets go nuts for it when it flowers. See, it, it, it's, got a, it's got a flower like the Gymea lily. Um, yes. So is, is it a lily? No, it's a it's a full on tree. It's okay, full on. That's a proper. Yeah. You know, oh, so the, it's it, it's like the erythrina, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that that it is an it's an erith that it is an erythrina. Oh, okay. Er, so, erythrina vet, ves, what is it? Vesperoto. Okay. There we go. Common common names are always uh, yeah. are always good, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are for me. I'm not so crushed at all these Latin names. Okay. Now you might, um, you might. But that you can see all the texture in the petals again, once again from that side lighting. The lighting brings out that. And that prints up really nice. I've got that printed big. So, before you're talking about prints, when we're talking about black and white things, I've got a 
big printer beside me and I can print up to A2 and I print my work as well. So. Oh, good. Now, you might have noticed that I was distracted because I mentioned earlier on that there was one of the shots when we were talking about um, the satin bowbird and something yep. that you don't see very often and being unusual. Uh, this is the shot that I wanted to bring up. Yes, very unusual. <laughs> um, so, ha, uh, what what do you know about this situation? I have no idea, really. All I know is the lorikeet was begging, and all of a sudden this um, eastern rosella came down and fed it, got in the hollow and fed it, which, uh, whether it's just responding to the begging call or... I went, yeah. I only saw it the once happen, and I was there for a couple of days, and I never saw it in there feeding it any other day. So, because well, it just responded it, to the begging call, I don't know, but it was unusual to see a Rosella feeding a lorikeet. Yeah, and and it certainly doesn't look like that lorikeet chick is a hybrid. No, um, and I'm not sure that it would be possible to have a. Um, a Rosella hybridizing with a lorikeet. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think it's just purely responding to the begging call for food. Yep. I think that's that's the most likely uh, explanation. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, now, was, that was just, it's just a rarity to, you know, and that's purely going out every week. The gardens, I go out there every Saturday, unless I've got things on, you know, family commitments or something else again doing a talk for somebody or something else but on a whole every saturday i spend the whole day in the gardens and the things you see that's just yeah. one of them that's right you never know what you you will see so I'm uh, there, rain, hail or shine. now naomi has a question and i think it's related to that shot of well all of the shots but the erythrina yeah um in that particular case no but sometimes yes a lot of the trouble with flowers is they're often blowing around in the wind, any light breeze, and they're moving. So, whereas fungi don't move, they're stuck stuck in the ground, and they on the whole they don't move very much. Though surprising they do, but the flowers quite often they move too much for me, so I can't so they're a, with it. So they're generally a, sing, uh, a single, yeah, a single shot. shot. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, most of the flower shots are a one off hit, and I've just got to use a greater aperture, so f fourteen. F18, things like that, to get more better depth of field. But you just sort of calculate your depth of field out based on the size of the flower and your distance and go with that. So for most of the uh, flower shots, so here's the uh, Awaratar, and this is the uh, the bog standard tilopia specificissima. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's the one. Uh, with the the terminal flower head and the notched um, leaves, uh, notched yeah. leaves, and that's got uh, the four different stages of the flower in this one shot too. So you got the bud yeah. down so the center, you got the bud in the center. The way yeah, yeah. So that's a really noticed. So you have the same, pretty much the same treatment, even though the intensity on your lights might be a little bit different. But yep. you pretty much Two the lights. same approach. Yep. For oh well that well there's a rear lit uh, mushroom exactly because you can see the spores falling out of yep. the mushroom yeah yeah um, that, that's, that's the advantage of backlighting you can actually start to see you know I didn't even realise I got that until I got home and then I go oh wow I can see all the spores coming out of it yeah that you know you don't you don't see that on the in the field you certainly can't see it on the back of your camera the spores but no, when I got right. home and put it up on the screen I went oh wow so yeah and, it's, and, uh, and probably most people won't be able to see that if they're looking on a on a phone or a or, no. or a smaller exactly. laptop. Even yeah. uh, uh, the detail of that in in that where the the dropped spores yeah. is pretty amazing. Um, yeah. How about these next two? Because you, the focus is the flower as much as it is the bird. Yes, um, which is the um, scarlet honey eater. It is, uh, or, or uh, what is it? My, yeah, yeah, uh, Melicopa, Melicopa, uh, El Arena. Yeah, 
Um, How do you pronounce that? Uh, I, I, I was going to put the Z in the wrong place for the. There's no Z. Uh, no, no, in the. Uh, for the. Let me let me look. Scarlet Honey Eater. Yeah, uh, yeah. it doesn't matter anyway. Um, so is. How are you lighting? No lighting, natural light. No lighting, so these are, no these are natural light. Okay. Yeah, and that, that'll be coming out very soon. One of those is already in flower in the gardens, a small one, but the big trees aren't in flower. They usually come out early March, so next week or so, a couple of weeks. I've been looking at them every week and they're not flowering yet. But once they do, you get about 10 or 20 of these scarlet honey eaters if we come up with that tree. I'm usually full of them. Now, are the scarlet honey eater resident in the gardens? No, they come in and out depending on flowers. Okay, so they're... Uh... Now, do they uh, are they moving through once, like in in the year, or no, no, they come no. in. Okay, so there's usually some about now because you got the black black thorn are easily in they're in flower now. Yeah, and they they usually go for them, and then this thing comes in flower, and they're usually into that as well. And they do do some of the gums when they flower as well, so they they're about and they actually they get them in the casserinas at times as well. Really, in the in the casual range, but they're possibly going for the mistletoe in there. Oh, that would almost be, almost definitely be what they were yeah. visiting. I would, I would yeah. say. Um, uh, but they they got a really high pitched squeak when you hear them call too. They're in the time good. that you've been visiting the gardens, uh, yep. Glenn, has yep. the approach to managing mistletoe changed? Do you, have you noticed? No, I don't think it's done much. The main, okay, so, the main, main so thing they it was never pruned out in the in the old days. No, no. okay. No. Uh, so what they do do, they got um, they were working through the African olive. Fantastic. Uh, that's that's thank, the one, Martin. Thanks, yeah. Martin. I uh, I, yep. I, <laughs> I still uh, I still don't want to call it. Anything but a scarlet honey eater for now. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, I use common names. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've been working through the African olive until the other day when I got a call. They said, Oh, what are you doing today? I said, Not much. I'm at home. They said, Oh, can you bring your camera to come out? I went out and they found an orchid growing in the middle of the African olive. Oh. It attached itself, uh, epiphyte orchid attached itself to the African olive, which they hadn't didn't have in the garden before and they knew. So they've sort of put a halt to the. African olive process for the moment. Uh, Only one. And was it a significant um, orchid? Like, uh, like is they've there a story some attached to it? They've got as well, and they've been trying to cross pollinate the thelmy ones with this and this to the thelmy to try and get them going. But yeah. Okay. Um, now here we go. Ma Martin just telling us about the uh, uh, the aforementioned. Bird with a yes. red head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really um, high pitched call of that. Yeah, high yeah. pitched whistle. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Um, and that's usually how you how you find them. You hear them, and then all that's of a sudden you, you see them all birds. over the place. Yeah, and once you yeah. once you associate the call with a bird, you'll see them everywhere. Uh, yeah. Um, so Vicky has asked: depending on what is being photographed, are you changing between one point and and other points cameras have. So I'm... Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, is, when, I'm is, when I'm shooting birds, I'm usually using the R5 and I'm using eye detect focus, so it automatically grabs the eye of the bird. Sometimes I'll go to the second back button and it just grabs the whole bird, and once it's grabbed the bird, then I'll go back to the eye detect. So I'm just using eye detect usually for these ones. So in the older cameras, yes, I'd use single point. Okay. And I'd move the point around to where I want it. So before I had the mirrorless camera, I was using single point focus and I'm also using spot metering. So the metering mode, spot metering and single point focus for the digital camera, uh, DSLRs. Mirrorless, so I set the exposure by my eye with a histogram in the viewfinder and I'm using eye detect for the point focus. Fabulous. Um, John, thanks for your input. Uh, Thanks for being part of it. Um, glad you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, very, very good. Um, 
Okay, tell us a little bit about the black-shouldered kites that we're looking at here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are they? What are they eating? Did you mouse. were you able to tell? Mouse. Uh, so definitely a mouse, not an antichinus yeah. or something. Yeah, mouse. Um, okay. Mouse out of the grasslands in the gardens. So they usually get mouse mice. Nankeen kestrels usually get lizards. These guys usually go for the mice. Okay. So there's a and they, they used to nest up on top of the hill above the bird hide. There's a, still a couple around, but I haven't seen them nesting in the gardens this year. I'm only seeing single birds around this year. But they uh, and, a couple of years ago they nested with three three young up there. Nice. And have you got a resident um, kestrel pair, or have you got more than a pair? Uh, there's usually a few nankeen kestrels. So we got nankeen kestrels. We got um. Pacific Bazaar. There was three young Pacific Bazaar there last weekend when I was there. So there's three of them fledged and left the nest. Um, Wedge-tailed eagles, little eagles, brown per goshawk, sometimes peregrines. grey goshawk, white morph, peregrine falcons. Yes, I got shots of peregrine. Peregrine falcons took down a cockatoo a while ago, and I had shots of them eating a cockatoo. Uh, um, now, did you say whistling kite? Whistling kite. Yeah, um, it has been seen in the garden. Square tail kite, definitely. Okay. Whistling so kite, you've got the square... yeah. Brown falcon, as well. Australian yeah. hobby and peregrine falcon. So there's quite a good collection of raptors in the garden. Yeah, it's a it's a great spot to go looking for raptors. Oh, and you've got some permanent water there. So if you got any yeah. swamp harriers, um, very spasmodically. I think I've seen okay. them there twice. Twice about ten years, probably probably after flood. Um, yeah, and there's been a spotted harrier there once as well. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, somebody got a really good shot of the spotted harrier on the ground. Very good. Yeah. We've got a few more. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, little having gorillas a having a barney. Yeah. Uh, yeah how just, how just unusual? Seems see some cockatoos having a blue. Um, yeah. Um, again, how far away were you from? Uh... Not that far for that one, maybe about fifty meters, if that. Oh, that well, that explains why you don't have such a beautiful creamy bouquet on the background exactly. there. Um, uh, straw neck divers, divers building yeah. uh, or a gathering nesting material. Yeah, didn't do anything with it, but started to build it. That's in one of the main lakes near the visitor center where that grass op oh, you can there's a lilies opposite, but opposite that there's a big grass hill and everyone has their picnics there. So that's where everyone's hundreds of people there on the weekend. Yeah, and I, uh, I wonder why it wasn't picking a, a a tree rather than on the ground, but yeah. uh, crazy. Uh, Pacific heron. We looked at yeah. that. What have we got here? Oh, the chuckle bird. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Laughing kookaburra. Yeah. Um, interesting how the light, the angle of the light. Um, and most people would say, "Oh, yeah, kookaburras have got a little bit of blue on their wings." Well, yeah, it's got not a purple in this, this case. Yeah. yeah, not according to this photo. No. That's because it's um, a different angle, yeah. Yeah, and iridescent foliage, so yep. you're getting a uh, a, a different uh, the light bouncing off, off at a different. Bit. Yeah. We've looked at the coot. I think we yeah. got through most of them. Oh no, yeah. we haven't. Here we go. Yeah. Almost oh, yeah. the best till last. Yeah, uh, eastern yellows. Yeah, eastern yellow robins. Now yeah. on uh, uh, on a. A scale of one to ten, how good are eastern yellow robins? Oh yeah, they're very photogenic. They just sit there and hang on the side of the trees for you. Follow that you one's around. actually got a leg band on from the. Bird I was just going to ask. That one's been banded. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Alan Leishman does the bird banding there Wednesdays. He's been doing it for years. Um, Ricky, Ricky said she did it with him once before. She mentioned in one of your podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he still goes out there. He he collects the birds in mist necks, weighs them, records them and bans them. The bird list I've got is partially his and them. I've extended on it from what I've got. That's where I've got the 197. So he's, he's had the, the official bird list in the gardens for years. I find new birds and I'll put them on, 
I, I'll send him a mail to him. Yeah. This one's sorted, send him the photo. Yeah. Great. Uh, just a couple more. There's one of you, one of the Raptors. Yeah, Wedgie. Uh, Wedge Sail Eagle. Um, yeah. Uh, is, do you have re resident wedgies? Like, do you, um, do, you, do you know this bird? I don't know that one. Um, they, a while ago, they were nesting in the, down the waddle in the garden, the back end of the garden. There was nesting yep. down there. Um, they're not there every day, but you do see them most days. You can see them about. There's a good yeah. population of rabbit in the garden, so uh -oh. those in the little eagle tend to like that. Although they're more into the carrion of the dead wallabies and wallaroos and things. Very good. And another amazing raptor. Yes. Powerful owl in the gardens. Not very often, but I got him. He was actually, he showed up on when I did a photography workshop one day. Oh, how, how lucky helpful. is that? What a helpful, helpful he fella. Was. He was the star uh, of the day. Very. Yeah, powerful owl. He's up uh, right opposite the visitor centre in the rainforest area under the figs. The fig trees just sitting there staring at everyone, and all the other birds were giving him hell. They weren't happy. Now we were talking sparrows before. Yeah. Uh, now we don't have a shot of a sparrow. No, you but don't. We do, have, we do have an invasive species. That's a backyard shot. That was another COVID uh, shot in the backyard. Uh, now the the noteworthy thing of this is you've got the the black background, so. Is natural this light. Natural, natural light. light. So, mm -hmm. so how did you how did so you set up the, the camera? Right. So you've got the back back of the backyard in the shade with all the trees, yep. and then you've got the sunlight hitting the bird as he flies from the fence to the water. And because if you've got water, you know birds are going to come to the water. Yeah. And they fly so that was the next place. question. They land certain places first, so they go yep. from the fence to the yep. water. You know where they're going to fly across. You can position yourself right. They get the shot with a back, back, black brand, which is actually dark. You just underexpose it, and then you expose yep. correctly for the bird. And there you go. So, Martin, there you go. If you've got that spot you said where you can sit up above the height of the trees and you know the birds are going to come past, all you need to do is get your little camping stool or something and sit yourself there uh, when the light when the light's right and wait for one of the birds to mm -hmm. uh, to whiz across. Uh, the birds come for either water or food, water, food or shelter. So uh, you got one of those three things, they're going to come. That's right. All right, just a couple of others to have a look at. Uh, Same. Backyard. Gla backyard. Backyard COVID shot. Yep. Okay. Did you do and, something during COVID lockdown? And I uh, almost, I think we're nearly saving the best till last. Um, just a great yeah. bird. That, that was a mushroom shot, so I was taking a picture of a mushroom when he came down for the water. The other camera was already <laughs> set up. So the camera set up on a tripod waiting for the shot, waiting to see if anything lands on the perch, and he just happened to land on there while I'm taking the pictures of the mushroom. So just slowly reach up, just fire the shot, off you go, and keep going with the mushrooms. The birds are climatised here. So. Now, this is uh, anthropomorphising. Uh, was, was it coming down to have a look at you was he checking um, you down out for a drink down for, down for a drink okay so there's a little creek underneath that that um tree stops in a creek yep so he comes okay. out of that comes down to drink okay it's a bit unfortunate i was hoping he was doing a eastern yellow Pretty robin rare. and coming down to no. uh to check you out no. thirsty coming down for a drink and just a, yeah i'm not a threat so he comes down wow well there we are glenn uh, a good start. I think I think we've reached the end. We're we're almost cracking oh, three hours. So. Three hours, yeah. I feel you've done well. <laughs> That's right. We 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 hadn't sort of budgeted for that. So, uh, hey, folks, everyone who jumped in for the comments and and got involved, that makes these sessions uh, really really easy from my point of view. Uh, thanks, Glenn, for showing us so much of you. Mm -hmm. uh, great shots and look look we need to um we need to pop this one up again because uh you you better tell us who took this shot and how it came about that was taken by me mate steve parish 
So that one was taken at Lemington National Park. But before that, Steve was running a workshop down Canberra. He did a two-day photography workshop in Canberra. And he hit me up before that and he says, can I come down and give him a hand? So he had me and another woman. Um, we went down and we gave him a hand for a two-day workshop in Canberra Botanic Gardens. And after that, Steve and me just did road trip for a couple of weeks, finishing up at Steve's place. for. A, he's got a bush block up in Queensland in the hinterland of the Gold Coast. So... Spent a couple of days at East Place and we just did travelling around. We went up to Lamington National Park and when you're at Lamington at um, O'Reilly's, they feed the birds, so all the birds are used oh, to people and they jump all over you. Yeah, you only had to say it was at O'Reilly's and I think we yeah. could all uh, uh, get uh, get the general vibe. So, Martin, exactly. thank you again for uh, popping in and and well, thanks, sharing Martin. your thoughts. Um, only... Only thing I I did want to sort of ask and round off, yep. Glenn. I think yep. I think we've covered the ethics and everything. I think right through the conversation, I think we've covered off on everything. But I uh, I haven't heard you tell me if there's a piece of gear that you are lusting after that you that you really want, or have you cured your uh, your case of gear acquisition syndrome? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, piece of gear I really want. I don't think it'll ever happen, but you never know. Um, 600 F4. 600 F4. Mm. Yeah, the price of a car. They're about, about 20, 20 30,000 bucks. <laughs> They weigh a ton, but they take a terrific shot. Um, um, before that, I will get the Canons just bought out a new 800. They bought a 200-800 F9, so it's a slightly better aperture, but it's got better minimum focus distance. So currently I use the 800 F11, although 100 to 500, depending on where the birds are. If I'm going in a close woodland, I'll put the 100 to 500 on. If I'm going far, I'll use the 800, whereas this lens got... It's only got a it's two metre minimum focus distance, so I can use the one lens for both, and it's got the eight hundred reach and a slightly better aperture. So it's you're still about. lusting, you're still lusting after glass. Yes. Um, do, do you think there'll come a camera body that you really need, or do you think that you're at the stage where there, there's really nothing more? that a camera body could give you other than perhaps running topaz or everything in body so you never had to yeah. plug into but your computer well, camera bodies these days they're finished pretty much with their iso wars where they're trying to get better isos they're pretty much finished that thing the cameras are going for now is better autofocus yeah. faster and more snappier autofocus it sticks on a bit so when you're chasing birds and they're flying sometimes the autofocus comes off but yeah the autofocus each model's getting better. The new Canon's book bringing up it's supposed to be a what they call a quad pixel autofocus, so it's supposed to be a lot better and sharper. So I'll have a look at it, and I'll probably end up with that. But yeah, and the, the new, new OMD is supposed to be pretty yeah. good. It um, is. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully the that. new Panasonics will be yeah. uh, will be good. I mean, they're talking about um, the next iterations all having eye detect, so that'd yeah. be nice. Yeah. Yeah, the I, I detect is really nice. You know, when I got the R5, you know, I have hardly touched the other cameras since. Um, I do want a second body. I've got, I've only got one mirrorless body. And when I do event photography, so when I do the event photography in the gardens, I have two different lenses, and I want the same, ideally the same sort of camera on both lenses. So instead of swapping from one to a mirror to a mirrorless, it's just much easier having the same. So. I will probably start trading in some bodies and when the new cameras come out and we get two of the same. So when I do event photography, it's much easier. It just makes life simpler. Yeah. And that's... you get paid for that. So when you get paid for it, the money goes towards it. So it helps. So Yeah, that's fine. I only buy camera it... gear when I've earned money from the photography. So if I can earn money from photography, that's when I buy the camera gear. It doesn't come oh, okay. out of an automated funds. So I've got to earn. Okay. If I buy a new gear, I've got to earn it. Oh, that's a that's a good rule. I've I've currently got a uh, the 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 wish list and the 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 
budgeting allocation coming out of uh, consolidated revenue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to yeah, I I want to get myself another another GH five so that yeah. uh, for exactly the same thing. So everything's yeah. the, the same, same, and then I yeah. then I've got my crappy little one that I can take run around shots without yeah. just using um, uh, a JPEG pretty much for taking yeah. stuff that you're just going to use on uh, uh, on the web. And then yep. I do I do want a smaller, lighter, hang around my wrist uh, camera that is almost as capable as the GH5. One that weighs about half as much and upgrade so, your iphone um upgrade your well, iphone and do it and that'll, well, that'll the, probably do you well it's nearly the same price for me yeah i know get... but you get a phone as well and you don't need the camera then oh yeah but i, I don't need another phone yeah that's fair yeah. enough yeah I don't, but, you know, I don't know but yeah you got it when you start looking for little cameras like that you've got to start questioning is a phone going to do it for you and then you yeah, get the phone, phone gonna... the camera going to do the same it's job. Just, just one piece of kit instead of two. Otherwise, you're going yeah. to have the phone still and you're going to have a camera. But the new new phones, they do pretty bloody good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was... I have been looking at an iPhone iPhone 11. That's about, yeah. as, that's about as recent as I think. Yeah, I'll, as you get. I'll, yeah. I'll, but well, yeah, well, I, I upgraded... Last year, I upgraded from an iPhone 6. So I had an yeah. iPhone 6S. So, yeah. 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 You got the 7 or... Eight, that's right. Or you got and... The, and, and yeah. And they're still doing security updates for the software, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's no. good enough. Yeah, um, no, no, I've, I've never been one of the ones for chasing phones. Cameras a little bit more so, but that's really, I've got to earn the money for the camera. So put camera, camera gear and photography trips as I've got to come out of what I earn from photography. So yeah, I don't earn a actually, great deal out of photography. So Actually, because we were talking about bodies, I mentioned bodies. Um, I need a couple of... Uh, stands and uh a light panel rather than a big bulky yeah. light box to sit in in here so i can get yeah. away from these two little panels that yeah. make me look red so yeah uh, yeah i've, which got, is I've a, got a big ring light i've got a ring light here and i can dial down the color temperatures on that that's what i've got I, for this these are quite old now and it's only very recent that i've started to look like a tomato and i'm sure that's because yeah, they're aging. Yeah, yeah. I never used to look like it. I don't look like a tomato in OBS or in, uh, or in the camera. So it's something to do with the way this lighting is interacting with, uh, with Streamyard nowadays. So yeah. yeah. But, um, I mean, I'm almost tempted to go out and get some of the stage makeup and, uh, <laughs> you know, put the put yeah. the white stuff on from the. Uh, uh, from the Middle Ages. So. Yeah, half the, half the time that would make you look like an Oompa Loompa, but well, they're orange. That's right. I mean, it's not... Uh, as, as you can sell, tell, Glenn, I worry so much about it. You know, yeah. I really worry. Yeah, we all, mate. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, um, Glenn, thanks. Um all right, mate. All Absolute good. pleasure to have the... To find a reason to be able to get someone from the Riot Squad in the studio to talk about uh, something that they are very skilled in. And look, plenty of people still uh, still here. Let's see, we've still got oh, no one from X anymore. Um, but yeah, YouTube and um, and Facebook, they've been in for the whole, uh, whole thing. Oh, Naomi's just made a comment. She'd love uh, the <laughs> 600 yes. F4. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. And Naomi yeah. said, "Thanks, really enjoyed it." Yeah, I'm. I'm oh, probably going to pick up the 100 to 300 um, Panasonic lens, yeah. the Mark well, One. Not the, not, yeah. yeah, not the weather weather sealed one. And then I'm still uh, still wishing for the 100 to 400. But I don't know how often I would actually use the extra reach. Well, I say that now, but. Once you get it, you probably will use it. Um, yeah, well, like I say, I yeah. Every time I pick up the hundred to five hundred, I wish I had the eight hundred on it. You always yeah. want more. But yeah. then again, a lot of my shots, I always I shoot tight, so I always shoot very cropped in a lot of the time. And I 
yep. I shoot two title times. So I, I've got to you know, back off a bit. So, yeah. Well, That's that, one of self criticisms on my own work. Well, that, that, well, do you, is that a habit that you can't break? Like, does that mean that you are so conditioned to the way you are used to shooting uh, that you can't, without really thinking about it, you can't pull yourself out of that habit? Pretty much. It's, 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 yeah. that, that's where my natural state comes into. I, you know, I automatically go to that. And then I've got to think about it and, you know, control myself a bit and then pull back a bit. But, yeah. 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 Uh, I need to get a bit more environment in the shots sometimes. Okay. Um, and Naomi says once you go yeah. big, you can't go back. Um, Spot on. Yes. She's right. Uh, I hope that doesn't right. get me in trouble with the censors. So. <laughs> so. All right, Glenn. Uh, Ripper, um, I'm going to be using some of the shots you sent me yeah. uh, about your garden to talk about yeah. tomorrow uh, for Habitat yeah. Gardening. And you will be at the gardens not listening. <laughs> I will try and listen a bit. I will. I do tune in at times, depending on where I am and what's happening at the garden. So I do on a Saturday. I'm in and out, sort of thing. But I'll yeah. try and make sure I'm in for part of it at least. Well, you'd you'd only be just arriving, wouldn't you, for the gardens no, at about nine thirty garden. when when I'm we get going? I'm at the garden from eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Oh, the garden's okay. open. Oh, I'm there from eight. So, um, yeah, I I am I am thinking about pushing habitat gardening earlier. Um, but we'll just we'll, we'll yeah, just no. see. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get in on. Yeah, this sure, is what sure always happens. Some questions or something you need. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll, we'll just say. I mean, tomorrow it's going to be very much a scratch. Uh, yeah. Uh, a scratch day. Really talking about small spaces again. But as we always get to the end, we then get a good comment. Um, yeah. Vicky uh, Vicky Pentecost in with. I've got an yeah. older 100, 400 Canon, but my N M50 stopped working. That's, uh, Vicky, that's something I've heard quite a bit. This is now the time where, what was it, about four years ago that the M50 was being pushed by everybody, a great yeah. entry-level camera. Yeah, and the yet, are, it's the M range altogether. That's right, and you're not the first person that I have heard that our oh, minds just stopped at uh, people telling me they just don't turn on any longer um so yeah you just yeah. have to you got a good lens so um yeah would you, which canon would you suggest as a replacement for an m50 in a similar court kind of um price bracket i, I, I would be going back to the mirrorless the r's R7 is like the equivalent of the 7D, so it's a crop body. It's relatively yeah. cheap. That's a really good birding camera. I know a lot of bird people went straight to that. They didn't go to the R5s because they don't do the other sort of work that I do. Yeah. If you're just purely in birds, the R7 is really good. Cool. Yeah. Well, there you go. Good, Vicky, the R, R7, I think, has got the same autofocus as the R3. So yeah. hopefully that's um, uh, something you can use there, uh, Vicky. Okay, let's knock it off. We've cracked three hours, mate. So <laughs> I, ne I, I never know how much time to budget yep. for talking photography. Um, but we did have, what, 40-odd images, so thanks, Glenn. Great. And we'll see you in the, in the right squad maybe on Monday for Jacinta Humphrey. Oh, I think Glenn's... Uh... Oh, no, you're back. You I'm were frozen, back, yeah, no, you, It all disappeared on me for a second. Yeah, no, you, you, you were frozen. Telling it something. Yeah, you were frozen. Although I was just saying we'll see you maybe on Monday for um, Jacinda Humphrey talking uh, yeah. urban birds. Well, Monday I'm in the city gardens because I've got a workshop on Tuesday, so I'm going to the city gardens to scope out what's around. So all Monday, right, we'll see, possibly not. We'll see everyone else uh, yeah. Monday. At uh, midday, I think uh, I think I've got it down. Yeah, midday Monday, nine thirty tomorrow morning for Habitat yeah. Gardening, where we're going to talk about Glen's summer Glen's garden, small space gardening, probably without Glen. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. This has been Photography okay. Friday. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd and a plant nerd. Glenn's a plant nerd, bird nerd, camera nerd, yeah. uh, fu and fungi nerd. So, yeah. Very good. See you, folks. See you. See you.